Uh, while we're framing up, uh, welcome back to the True Jordy podcast. podcast for those um, who have missed it. Uh, big shout out before we get started to Gymshark, our sponsors. Uh, when we signed with them, you know, they offered us lots of cool sports guys and we are going to get around to having some of them on. But they also said, you know, Sean does cool sports. You know, you do you, do you, you be a True Jordy podcast, what you've always been and a big part of our little story our journey has been the man in front of me Sean Atwood one of the most loved guests we've ever had on the show thank you so thanks for coming back I wish it was under better uh, circumstances mate uh, for those who don't know we sort of talked about it on social media lately uh, your best friend and one of the biggest parts of your journey wild man aka Peter Mahoney uh, has passed away very sadly one of my regrets is that we didn't get him back on and obviously you know you, him, I'm busy doing this and you know, I was like oh we'll get him on we'll get him on and it's just uh, tragic and uh, when you sent me that text uh, recently me heart went out to you mate because uh, I know how important he's been to you so um, yeah you, you reached out to me just for those who don't know and said you know maybe it would be better to come on the podcast and talk about it because it's such a difficult thing to talk about basically you guys i have credited over and over again for launching my youtube mm. and i'm hoping coming on here today is going to help me relaunch because i've not been able to pick up a camera since wildman died mm. that was a few weeks ago now and people are saying all these people have done all these tribute videos to him why haven't you done a video to him and man i just feel sick to my stomach every time mm. i try and think about doing it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it's, we'll help you today, but yeah. buddy, because I know how hard it can be to talk about someone you love so much and you're missing them, yeah. and it's still very raw. Yeah. And to be honest, like if you hadn't asked to do this, I would have never suggested it because it was like I just want to let you grieve in your own time. But uh, yeah. you know, if you're feeling like you need a bit of a jump start, uh, we're more than happy to help. You helped us. Um, so, so, so let's just go back, I guess, and talk about yeah. Wildman's health issues and how he ended up in the situation he did in so peter went up to about 28 and a half stone in recent months and it's just come back now that we found out it was multiple organ failure mm -hmm. wow so when his dog died he wasn't getting out the house much i offered to buy him a new dog and he refused and he was really buzzing because we were doing the podcast together that he was co-interviewing it was yeah. doing really good on one of the podcasts we look down at his trousers and they're all wet and we say well ma'am why are your legs leaking like that leaking water he's oh it's, it's just water i'm gonna bottle it and bless people <laughs> That was his sense of humor to the end. That was his sense of humor. But I went home and humor. I went home and Googled it, mm. and it was actually an ingredient from his blood. Mm. And his ankles swelled up like this big mm -hmm. with pus and blood. And they had to put, he described it as a syringe that you would use on an elephant mm -hmm. into his ankle to extract all the rhubarb and custard. Right. I put a video up about six or seven months ago saying wild man needs help in hospitalization this was during the covid outbreak yeah, as well yeah this was my first inclination that something was seriously wrong because as you know from the stories of the wild man he has no fear of anything whatsoever and we can mm. we can get to some of those stories but he called me or i called him and he said I could barely breathe. I'm scared. Mm. It was the first time I ever heard fear in his voice. Mm. So I thought, all right, something serious is happening here. We've got to get him in the hospital. But because of Corona and his own brave stance, he said that there are all people dying right now. They need the hospital beds more than I do. So there was a bit. So, of so was there a bit of a pushback from the hospital when he tried to be treated originally. yeah yeah they basically told him you got to stay at home call your doctor yeah that was ongoing the whole time mm -hmm. he couldn't probably get in and get on a drip and get all the medical attention that he needed that could have mm. possibly saved his life mm. so we just filmed some podcast a couple of months ago and we went out for a meal and he um 
started to feel a bit ill during that week we had about eight eight podcasts scheduled mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he, some of the days he couldn't come in and I got a request from another guy who wanted to interview and I ran down all the wild man symptoms and he said look he's got to get in hospital he's got to get on the drip mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so I called wild man and said this could be fatal you got to get in the hospital and he sent me a response on the text saying you know he's contacted the doctors he can't get in the hospital because of corona not don't worry i love you i'm going to be all right all this stuff and um he it's all right mate you just take your time pal he was rushed to hospital he couldn't breathe and then he fucking died (laughs) just like that it's all right bro (laughs) you've got to let it out mate best friends for like 40 plus years man it's like we knew everything we thought mm-hmm. I could finish his sentences we knew what we were thinking that's how tight we were like twins mm-hmm. it's just so weird to think he doesn't exist he does exist though that's the thing <sighs> you know that You're, you always will you know what I mean yep he is immortalised mm. on the videos there's, there's, there's very we've interviewed everyone the stories of wild man are as legendary as they get pal yeah and you're going to carry that one yeah and that's what he would want yeah for sure mate yeah yeah he would that's he what would. the day is about yeah yeah he's looking down on me now thinking have my strength go, sure. go with it have my strength go with it yeah I'm you sorry for you, mate. Honestly, yeah. I'm so fucking sorry for you. Yeah, I yeah. know he loved you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you and him were like me and Loz, do you know <laughs> what I mean? We did joke about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. looking at the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's. Yeah. I'm just so sorry for you, mate. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, because it did feel quite sudden. It was very, very sudden. Long. Yeah, he was just on the. F- I was on the phone with him constantly, and he's just cracking his jokes. You know, saying he was going to be all right. He's got doctor's appointments and bam, just like that, he was gone. They didn't call him wild man for nothing. He, he certainly like, he lived life on the edge. And when yeah. I met him, you know, you told us all these stories yeah. and they, here he comes, this larger than life figure. And I'm a motherfucking massive guy <laughs> myself. So I'm looking at him and he's looking at me we're like, whoa, you know, he's a giant, wasn't he? You know, yeah. he was a giant man. It's rare that yeah. you meet someone who's bigger than you. Mate, 28 and a half stone. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But obviously, like, you know, he hadn't looked after himself, bless him. And and in all the stories, that's one of the things, that, that fearlessness. And, um, you know, I was watching a few of our old podcasts the other day, and I was watching the one we did with him. And you just see him talking, and you think, you lived for the moment, you, mate. And and that's got to be applauded in a way, you know. And, and and often people who do that, they do have an early early end of their life, sadly. But what a fucking life, man. Like, the the way he attacked it I, I i remember even on the podcast i'm like you didn't think much of this through before you did it did you <laughs> he just went for it you know what i mean he, yeah if it felt like a good idea at that moment well he was doing it you sometimes know even I mean? it felt like a bad idea in that moment i think he was doing it <laughs> no, but um you know um what what has been sort of the process you've been going through in the days um after his death how, how is your brain processing because I find with death uh, they call it the stages and you know when you hear that you think oh well everyone goes through the same thing and we go through you know your grief your anger your, all these things but realistically no one has the same experiences and no and the stages come back sometimes and you go r- through anger again or whatever so how are you feeling so the day I found out was in the morning when I had two podcasts scheduled to mm-hmm. film and I found out... How did they f- let you know? Who was it who let you know? So I think it was his wife and his cousin Hammy contacted mm-hmm. me. I went into a state of shock, looking back now, I understand it, but I didn't understand it at the time. Mm. So I went and filmed those podcasts. How did after- they go? How was that in there? Were you like, is this even happening? Or kind of, did you just block it out? <sighs> I don't know, because what happened after the podcast was, I went to order some food... And I was stood at the checkout and they'd give me the food. And I said to the person, I don't know if I've paid or not. Uh uh And I had already paid. Uh I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I just got through the day on autopilot. 
It's fucking mad how that happens, isn't it? Looking back at it. Because now I can't even pick a camera up and do a video. Yeah. No. And it's two weeks later. But on the day I found out, I went and did the podcast like I was supposed to do. And then the next day, it just really hit me. Mm. Your, your brain goes into that, like, airbag mode where everything's just, like, not real. Yeah. Fuck. It man. wasn't real. You, you almost didn't want to acknowledge it in a way as well. <sighs> I couldn't believe he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. It's all right, mate. This is going to happen throughout this podcast, so you just got to let it happen. It's all right. They told me. I couldn't believe it. I just went about my day mm -hmm. as if it hadn't happened mm -hmm. that's normal mate honestly it people deal with things it, is. it took a day for me to <clears throat> for me to realise it happened mm -hmm. You're doing well, you. <sighs> you I promise you, you're doing well. I here. tell you what, it's the support from everybody and you guys, mm -hmm. and all the messages and all the guests who did tribute videos. Mm -hmm. The messages that were coming in every minute. Mm -hmm. um, that really, it was like the spirit. I felt everything just raise. Mm. You see, growing. You've interviewed some of the baddest men in the in Britain. <sighs> And you see them bubbling away on their tributes to the wild man because yeah, obviously yeah. he touched them, you know. He was one of them. They identified with him. He was in that brotherhood of <clears throat> bad motherfuckers, but also good people deep down, a lot of them. The funny thing is when Peter interviewed them, <laughs> they all look small yeah. Yeah. next to him. Mm -hmm. Big bodybuilder guys. Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest, baddest guys. They all look tiny next um, to him. Um, um, Peter wasn't... Uh, um, a weightlifter he just <laughs> was that big you know what I mean he's the force in nature yeah larger yeah. than life yeah that's what I thought of when he died you know yeah yeah I said to text Lawrence I said larger than life <sighs> I think he knew because on the phone calls towards the end of it he was really telling me how much he loved me and mm. stuff <sighs> I'm glad I'm glad you've had those conversations though because that's what carries you through this stuff mate you know what I mean? I, I'm a firm believer when people die, it's the strength of the relationship that we had with them that actually helps you get through their death. You know, it oft, often, it sometimes, it can go, if you, if you felt like you didn't say what you wanted to say or you didn't have that relationship, you can't get over that situation the way you can when you did have those conversations. And those are going to really help you now. I promise you. They really are. And all those hours of videos you've got together, all those funny moments, like when he, he fell asleep in the middle of one of the podcasts, <laughs> I remember sending it to Lawrence and I'm like, I'm not sure this is going according to plan yet. <laughs> he's like, you say that, but you fall asleep in the middle of it. Tell you, tell you what. And he's sitting there like half asleep and you're like, well, man, well, man. You know, all those moments that you've had, because, you know, if you'd never got into this, and you guys had just been off camera and living your lives and telling these stories in the pub, you wouldn't have him immortalized the way you do. And that's a real thankful thing we've got. I've been watching the videos nonstop, including the one you just described. Mm. And it went slow motion. I turn around and tap his, I tap his leg. <laughs> and you can see the look in my eyes. I'm like smiling. But yeah, the guest wasn't the best that day, no. was it? <laughs> yeah, it's not a reflection it. on the guest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless him. I didn't fall asleep. I was just resting my eyes. <laughs> he said. Oh, bless him. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, he, I'll tell you one thing. He's the only man ever to come on this show and have drink me. So. <laughs> By quite a distance yeah, as well, yeah. I think. He was yeah. sinking them. <laughs> you wouldn't feel this way, though, if you hadn't been so close to him, you know? It's a reflection oh, of the great man. relationship. We went you through the most him. intense, wildest, emotional, scurry, crazy, drugged up, <laughs> insane partying times incarceration times of our lives together mm -hmm. let's just go back and talk about how you guys came yeah, to be yeah. friends because I think that moment seems mm -hmm. quite clear for you mm -hmm. isn't it? just growing up in our little town he was two years younger than me and 
I was part of a little gang called the Sweats and it was Peter's oldest brother was our gang leader so Peter was not allowed to join and his oldest brother would beat him up and do cruel things and in the end I splintered off from them and just started hanging out with Peter and Peter just grew massive in the school the teachers I think he put a teacher in a bin because the teacher <laughs> had <laughs> talked some shit to him right. and he just picked the teacher up and put him in a bin wow so the teachers then were scared of him and they had him outside with the caretaker raking leaves and stuff. Wow. He was getting in a lot of fights. He would get in nightclubs and start fights with bouncers and his face would just look like be black and blue like a train had hit him. Why, why, why was he starting fights? Why was he sort of like that, do you think? <sighs> I guess if you go back hundreds of years, he would have been like the fearless person that enjoyed violence, the mm -hmm. first person to jump up and protect the village. Right. But that kind Absolutely. of person's an, an anachronism now. If you if watch like Braveheart and there's this big guy called Hamish, <laughs> like that would have been him, you know what I mean? Like we got him at the front. You know? <laughs> For some reason, I've been watching the Vikings non-stop in the last couple of weeks. Honestly, he's like one of them, though, isn't he? Yeah, he is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, like in that era, it would have been completely normal. But in this era, he ends up in prison and, and all of that, you know what I mean? In, in that era, he's a hero. So he got in trouble ended up in prison me and his cousin Hammy used to go up to a quarry on a hill called Pex Hill and there was a tree overlooking it and we called it the thinking tree and that's where we set our life goals and I said to them I was going to go to America and make a million in the stock market and fly you guys over and Hammy was like, yeah, you will with all your shirt trading because he was aware of what I was doing wild man would say I'm going to prison because of my red dots he was setting out he was setting that out as his goal yeah right yeah he said the red dots are telling me to hurt people i'm gonna spend the rest of my life in prison when he says red dots so he had red dots in his head which he later described as the red mist but he used to enthusiastically call it as the red the red dots and he'd say the red dots are kicking him telling me to hurt people and I'd say, Peter, what are the red dots telling you now? And they're telling me to do this and that. It would be some kind of violent act. Mm. And his eyebrow would go up as well when he was about to actually act on the red dots. Right. So I would always know when the eyebrow cocked, oh, God. something crazy Ooh. was going to happen. I, I, you, you yourself have uh, bipolar. I was diagnosed with that, yeah. yeah. Mm. Do you wonder if he was um, suffering from something similar? When you, when you hear someone from a young age talking like that, it reminds me of something my dad would have said, for example, you know? Whatever he had was magnified by the drug cocktails that he did. Because mm. in America then, it just went to the next level. So this is how old were you when you had these red dots experiences? So while mum was seeing the red dots, hearing the red dots when he was uh, like middle teens. Really? Fucking yeah, hell, that's a heavy thing to come out with at 15. So we made a plan to get Wildman to America to become a wrestler, to channel that energy <laughs> so he wouldn't get any trouble. <laughs> but he did end up going to prison in the UK first. Mm -hmm. So I'm working away in the stock market and he's in prison. This is fighting related prison. He ended up in prison because he was told that somebody had ecstasy pills and the person didn't have ecstasy pills, but he, I think he knocked the person out. Five pounds fell out of the person's pocket. And wild man went and spent that money on a kebab, which then constituted street robbery. Right. Jesus. So he ends up going to prison for this really stupid offence. For, for long? Not for long. I can't remember how many years, but he went from like, prison kind of makes people harder and rougher. Of course. Do you think that sort of institutionalized him a bit and made him like even more a furious person? Yeah, because yeah. he was maximum aggression when he came over. Okay. And that first trip didn't last very long. That was the one that got him banned from America and deported for being a menace to society. So I rented him a house near the Georgian Dragon English pub in Central Phoenix thinking he'll just go and have a beer with the expats and he'll chill out and I'll get him this job as a wrestler while I'm working in the stock market. And then me and my girlfriend go over to visit him one night in his 
place a couple of months after he's been in there and we knock on the door and a bunch of Mexicans answer mm. and I say where's Peter and they say Peter pizza we didn't order pizza and I'm no Peter Peter he lives here then they all pull guns out so me and my bird like start backpedaling across the road wild man comes just bouncing over the road smiling he's like don't worry about them la they're the local crack dealers the guy at the back is the head of them he's a colombian he wants to invest money in the stock market through yeah they like to move around a lot so i've rented them this place out and they're letting me stay in their place and they're buzzing because i can do a hundred dollar crack rock in one breath and i'd be in there and he'd be like There'd be a circle of Mexicans with the Colombian crack dealer. Wild men would be in there arm wrestling people. And then he'd do like a hundred dollar crack rap. And he'd be go, red dot, sizzle, sizzle, red dot, sizzle, sizzle. And he'd just be looking like this. He's not slept in days. And then he's arm, he's arm wrestling someone down and, <laughs> and smoking crack. And that was his existence. Mm -hmm. And were you, were you, weren't, you weren't trading in the drug game yourself at this point? At that point, I was in the stock market, but it was the connections that Wildman introduced me to during that first visit that established the criminal enterprise. Wow. Because he was in multiple properties in a very short period of time because he get kept getting kicked out of them for dramatic reasons. Mm -hmm. So someone came over to buy drugs off the Mexicans, a man and a woman, a couple, the woman went over the road to get the crack off the Mexicans because while man was back in his apartment now they'd moved o over the road and the guy who come over had a gun while had not seen guns before and he demonstrated the gun and shot himself in the head dead so right. it ended this was that same story I that, remember yeah. this yeah. yeah so I remember yeah. uh, obviously wild man telling the story and he said the guy puts the gun to his head and went this is how we do it in America yeah and that was such a strange moment because it it did seem like he didn't think that there was a bullet in the chamber at that moment, the way he was prattin' around. And Wildman's got a dead body right in front of him out of nowhere. And he's just sitting there going, I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, but when the, when the cops come around, they've already had problems with him. The problems with Wildman and the cops um, at that point had only been like just walking around, drinking with open cans and stuff like that nothing major yet because was, this was his first visit mm. and this death happened quite quickly he definitely didn't have anything to do with no because no. here's what happened right so because i know that people listening might be like this people are sounds... gonna go yeah the guy just shot himself <laughs> yeah like people you know what i mean yeah, skeptical. no the police aren't that stupid so here's what yeah. happened i'm in the office i get a call from one of my family members saying have you seen headline news I'm like no why well, it's all over headline news. Peter's place right now, yellow tape all around it. Police tape. There's been um, a shooting. Someone's dead. It's, it could be him. So I'm thinking, holy shit, it's wild, man. So I jump in my car, leave the office, zoom up there. I've got some drugs in my car. And I see all this police tape and police vehicles and camera crews and headline news people. And I'm thinking, all right. Perhaps I better go and um, get rid of the drugs and come back when things have calmed down. So I waited until the afternoon and went back and there was nobody there at all. There was just a police tape. So I go in and Peter's in there with a homicide detective. And this guy had a very serious looking face on him. And he said to me, you know, who are you? And I said, well, you know, I signed for this place for Peter. I brought him over to, from England and put him here by the, the British pub and um, you know I'm working this in the stock market and he asked for my business card and stuff so they did all the tests on Peter the ballistics tests and everything because when someone shoots themselves the gunpowder residue is you yeah. know obviously on that person so it, it, it clearly showed that Peter wasn't involved in it now the cop the homicide cop started to open up to us and this is one of the most insane stories I've ever heard in my life I said to him, you know, what kind of crazy cases do you work on? What's, you know, because I was always fascinated by serial killers. Mm. 
researching the book early on here just yeah. trying to get it just yeah. shows that it was in you even yeah. then that inquisitive well, nature well the serial killer thing is so common when I arrived in Arizona there was a serial killer and there was even a serial killer of cats that was shooting cats in people's windows that it's seems a, less that's how crazy weird it is out now there. yeah well I, he said to me the serial killer that's killing the joggers and throwing their heads into Salt River we've kind of got him and I said, what do you mean you've kind of got him? And he said, we've got his DNA. Because what he's doing is, he's cutting the heads off the joggers. And he's skull fucking them so hard <laughs> that when he ejaculates, the semen gets embedded so deep in the skulls that even though these heads are bobbing up and down on Salt River, you the can. Salt River water is not washing the semen out of the skulls. Mm. Mm. Naturally, you, I mean, this is this is just science. <laughs> Sorry, but it's never it's never a normal podcast with Sean. Just a it? reminder: this podcast is a tribute to Wild Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be fair, I think he'd love it. Just, yeah, he would, he would love it. He would want hilarious. to go full on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say yeah. it all, say it all, mate. But yeah, and, and you, me, Jesus, so, Arizona was not a normal place. Anything so, so this cop just opens up to you and yeah. sort of just and and obviously yeah. they're quite proud of this. They think they've sort of caught him in a way and. What do you guys say after that? I mean, I was just gobstruck. And I just like was telling people back at the office and telling my girlfriend this story I just found out mm. because I was just amazed. Mm. Yeah. Did they catch that serial killer then? I don't know. Right, okay. We'll yeah. have to look we should look up to that. Yeah. The skull fuck killer. Mm. Yeah, joggers. Yeah. In Salt River. That's a, Tell you what, like, I mean... When people say jogging's good for you, I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I think I've been doing the right thing all these years. I get you want to watch yourself. The all front, right? I will. Um, so, but say, um, so what I am curious about is kind of... Uh, How did you pick up off the back of that? Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm interested in is, obviously when he first arrived in America, America was quite a different place when you guys went from the America yeah. we probably know now. Although, you know, obviously the Trump is president. It, it does feel like back. crime was a lot more easy to get away with back then though. What was, what, yeah. Ecstasy like, trafficking was... Well, let me tell you what happened after he left that, okay. that house. So he moves to a house on the west side with two women and a steroid head disco dancing cowboy bouncer. Are the fixed. two women romantically linked to him? No, the two women are like in the drug community mm -hmm. and this guy, this, this cowboy steroid head guy thinks he's a big tough guy. Mm -hmm. And Something tells me this isn't going to end. <laughs> So they're behind on the rent. So I go up, check the place out. I cut a check for this apartment complex on the west side. And I get a call the next day from the apartment manager. And she says, uh, Peter's, we've ha we have to evict Peter. This was within like a day. Mm. I said, why? She said, he's beat his roommate up. I said, well, how do you know he's beat his roommate up? What proof do you have of this? And she said that the roommate, an argument was heard by the neighbors and there was banging and the roommate was seen by the neighbors running through the apartment with plasterboard mm. sand all over his face, running for, his, running for his life through the apartment. And there were human had size holes in numerous of the walls. Wow. So I went and grabbed Peter real quick and said, look, what's happened here? And Peter was like, he was telling me to keep things tidy and put my dishes away and stuff like this. So I just put his fucking head through the wall. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he'd done it so fast that they hadn't had time to cash the check at the apartment. So I managed to stop the check. <laughs> And the two women who were living there, one of them had a boyfriend in Tempe, Arizona, which is the university town. This is where the criminal enterprise starts, is out of this apartment. Mm -hmm. She said, my boyfriend over there's behind on his rent. If you fix the situation, wild man can move in over there. And that was the apartment complex where we did the first experiment as shown in the Bang Abroad episode, I went out to California, got that first thousand ecstasy pills. I think we talked about that on mm. the first podcast, mm -hmm. Wolf of Wall Street One. Those pills are brought back to Wildman's apartment in that complex called Rancho Marietta. 
those pills were like gone in a weekend. And while my men just threw constant parties out of that apartment, Russian mafia, Italian mafia, Mexican mafia, transgender, she male street prostitutes, gang bangers. It was just nonstop. And that's how I made all of the criminal connections that enabled me to establish the criminal enterprise was through Peter. Was that the place to be then? That was sort of, was that considered cool? Like, did you feel cool when you first started? Do you think yeah. you felt cool when you yeah, first started? Yeah, yeah. The thing with me and Peter is, I had anxiety as a teenager. A wild man would just walk in anywhere and own the place. And that opened the door to me to make friendships with people. Because mm. you was with him, you felt a safer. Yeah. But also all the attentions on him as well. So it's kind of like you can relax a bit and not feel that anxiety as much. And obviously the ecstasy was helping as well. I, was I, I had the false courage from the drugs. Mm. And Wildman always would say, you know, I've got your back. I'd take a bullet for you and things like that. And God bless him. He did have the heart of a mountain lion and he would take a bullet for me. But some of the situations probably put our lives more in danger than, than, than we um yeah yeah we'll get to that though uh, how, um, <laughs> i guess what i'm curious about is obviously he's new in town he's walking around with an open bottle and you say the police are stopping him yeah yeah is this like, I like, guess what I'm like jaywalking to, with budweiser's and stuff but i guess what i'm trying to g g uh, gauge is then is this the same police officers stopping him over again and being like same guy again here or is phoenix such a big place i don't know what the atmosphere is like like how much of a wave you guys are making because to me when you say Mexican mafia turning up, you know, Russian mafia, prostitutes, all this sort of thing. I feel like I'd notice that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If that happened in my apartment block, and it sounds like there's, you guys are attracting a lot of attention, but I can't work out whether you are or not. Okay, so this is not like a small town. This is massive city that's just very transitional. A lot of people coming in and out. I don't know how many millions of people live in uh, Phoenix, and Tempe is like a big suburb of it, which is a university town, <coughs> and they have multiple giant apartment complexes. You just disappear into them, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right, like okay. we, we would have like someone in the front building would be like selling the pills. In the next building back, there'd be someone with cash. And then you'd have like protection in another building. Right. But that's how we structured it over time. So you kept everyone close together? Yeah, it was well well organized, yeah. And who was that you who organized that or was that between you and Wildman? Like what was well, Wildman's role within it? Wildman's that? role was to <laughs> I mean, like I said, he's a force of nature, so whatever he did, he did. And it, he just naturally progressed into the person who everybody was scared of. Right. So he, they would pay their debts. He didn't have to beat them up, he would just move in with them. <laughs> and uh, that was the biggest thing that Wildman would move in with because if Wildman moved in with you so if you're in debt he's moving in basically yeah okay. he, he's moving in and, and so are all of the people of the night he's partying with uh -huh. like within the first day there's a cook in your kitchen cooking up crack you've got um, transgender you know <laughs> prostitutes <laughs> prostitutes coming in Native American uh, gang bangers and there's nothing you could do about it the Mexican mafia people are taking your TV their runners are taking your TV and your uh, other appliances and you're just staring at this and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it so that's that's how people were kept in line they were afraid that Peter would move in with them it felt like so correct me if I'm wrong here but it did, obviously you, you were the brains of the situation generally speaking and it felt like wild man the way he he the way he looked after you, you sort of looked after him in turn in a different kind of way because he's there and he's enjoying all of the fruits of the labour and he's getting as many drugs as he wants. He's doing whatever the fuck he wants. And all he has to do, basically, is be the big heavy and be the threat. And as long as there's no problems, he's just going to keep having a good old time. That was it. He just had a good old time and he was very good at talking to people. So just going back to what Lawrence was saying then. So if a cop caught him jaywalking with a Budweiser, I'm over here from England. I'm on holiday. Right. I'm visiting, visiting my cousin, Sean, you know, Innocent, buzzing, very... buzzing off, you know, they don't have, you know, he'd just be buzzing. Uh, and he did, he did have quite a sort of, I know it's a weird thing to say about someone who's obviously a heavy for quite a big drug organization, but he did have quite a charming smile and quite kind eyes. And I've been watching his videos in the past week and he's the funniest motherfucker on the place of the earth. He's very the charismatic. Things he, yeah. the things, he's charismatic and he just, he's so honest. He just says anything that comes into his head no matter how non-politically correct you'll just say it 
and our people love that authenticity about him it, it, he seems a bit of a um, after meeting him and seeing all those videos and all the stories oh. there's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde thing though so it's like on the one hand if he respects and likes you he's warm big cuddly bear big caring guy but on the other hand there's a couple of photographs where you see the mean dark side that he had within him as well and there's a complete opposite there's a there's a there's a scary thing going on there where he, he would literally kill someone if he had to you know what I mean I'll tell you the story of the giant I don't think I've ever told you the story of the giant mm. so me and Wild Man are in some like dodgy pool hall slash biker bar place mm. where you know it's ex-Vietnam vets with scars on their faces and crystal meth users did you ever think not to hang out in these places and just sort of you <laughs> no, know that does seem like a recipe for disaster yeah man. you know when you tell us all these stories I'm always like well you took yourself there if you'd have just gone to the gym for the day maybe you know gone to the library read a few books <laughs> that was the fun of it I was on an adventure with Peter did you seek he, it out he, do you think did you seek it out a little bit do you think so you guys? even though I had an anxious side when I was on drugs I was balls to the wall I would I would go full on as Exciting. well no I didn't like violence ever but I did like the excitement and the, just the insaneness of the party scene. And of course you were best friends with Wildman, but you didn't like violence ever. <sighs> that, that's the thing though, it's, it's, it's a bit like having a Rottweiler or whatever, isn't it? It's like, th there's a funness about not knowing what can happen next. <laughs> exactly, yeah. the right. not knowing what can happen next yeah. nurse mm -hmm. becomes quite addictive. And you two would, you two would sort of do that together because you were both in it together. So, you know, I guess you two would go, we'll go here today and the other one would just go with he liked to gravitate towards the most dangerous environments the dodgiest bars the streets that had like pink hotel rooms where you pay by the hour so you can get a sex worker off the corner and she'll be able to bring over the local crack dealer they're the environments he loved to be in and he said to me that when there was complete chaos around him what you know when TVs had been thrown through windows and gunshots were going off and crack dealers were coming over um, he could relax and fall asleep finally <laughs> Brian says a very similar thing to me actually yeah. <laughs> this is mad isn't it so so to take me back to this biker bar you've got the probably the Hells Angels or whoever else in there um, <gasps> and you know he's there you're there what happens next we're in the bar playing pool i think we're high on crystal meth wild man's this bar is quite close to does that affect your pool skills just out of interest? Yeah, yeah it enhances them uh, <laughs> i ended well. up on the georgian dragon pool team i was doing jump shots i was shit hot on crystal meth because right. in the beginning the extra alertness and you thinking you can accomplish anything the confidence it gives you in the beginning enhances your skills this is in the long window. run the side effects kick in and destroy everything mm. but in the beginning there's a little window of good at pools yes, right. so yes, there, yes. there's something um, I heard about uh, pilots microdosing on amphetamines because it keeps them so sharp and a lot of them end up struggling with it you the, know, mil I'm, I'm military, the military pilots the military yeah. give yeah. pilots speed and this is why taxi drivers and lorry drivers are huge customers for speed to keep them alert while they're driving keep them on the road it's amazing yeah. isn't it so so you're on there you're playing your pool sinking every shot <laughs> <laughs> doing mm. jump shots mm -hmm. you know the great thing about that is so when you're first there and you're very alert fantastic after a while you can't tell whether the shot's going in or not anyway so it doesn't really matter you think the shot's are going in yeah. okay <laughs> and a giant comes in this is another guy who's a big bat big man now this is a giant this guy is like seven foot ish with a funny chin and the funny teeth and he looks like not quite andre the giant the wrestler but from cut from the same mold i'm imagining that uh, the guy off uh, the james bond movies right yeah yes. Jaws. Jaws, yeah. yeah 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 so i look at the giant i look at wild man and the eyebrows like this have they had any beef or this is just like no He's just looking at him going, you're alpha male, I'm an alpha male. This is going to happen. The two yeah. biggest guys in the room basically just look at each other. So well, weird. Wildman's looking at him like, pray, this guy's my prey. Right. So I say, <laughs> Peter, don't. 
and his eyes are just like he's been up for days on crack and his eyes are completely red and there's nothing I can do to stop him so he walks up to the giant and holds his hands out and he says my name's Peter <laughs> fuck no what's your name <laughs> and the giant says his name and Peter starts squeezing the giant's hand and this is just not politically correct at all I'm not condoning what Peter said and wild man says if I were you I'd be in the circus you fucking freak and the giant looks down with his bugged out eyes now goes, what did you just say and wild man goes you fucking heard me if I were you I'd be in the circus you fucking freak so, so, so the, lock, the hands are locked and the giant's like this and wild man just looks like the devil he's been up for like God knows how long. And he's just looking up like this, like the devil. And the giant's looking down. There's a standoff. And people are watching. And in the end, it just all reversed. And they made friends. What do you mean? Re it just sorry. reversed. They, they didn't fight. So who broke? I can't remember exactly. Okay. All I remember is thinking... Whoa. And the giant goes, come outside. I want to show you my car. So we went outside... <laughs> And the giant had a special car where he was sitting in the back of it because his legs were so long. And he gave us his number. Peter was talking to him. Like I said, he's got the gift of gab. Um, he gave us his number. And Peter was like, yeah, come and hang out with us and party with us. And um, you can come, come debt collecting with, with the, uh, the Mexicans. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm up for that. And he gave us his number. But we, but we lost his number. Can you imagine? wild man and a giant showing up at your door you owe us money jesus i, I don't know I, f I feel like we're we're talking about memories and they're good memories of yours yeah but i know you have very soft some soft memories of him as well the yeah. way he isn't the big brute who wants to fight everyone but he is a bit of a gentle guy and stuff like that have you got any more memories like that where you feel like was that later on in his life where he mellowed a bit and he was a bit more gentle with you? When we all first got arrested, there was a group of 13 of us and half of them were women. And we've been through processing with Tempe police and we're all in the van then. They take us over to the Madison Street Jail. This is May 2002. All the new arrestees are outside of the jail and this place is crazy. You've got gangbangers, drug dealers homeless rival gang members threatening each other people who are high people who are drunk people who have been tasered people have been beat up by the cops so you've got quite a lot of them are quite maniacal people who are in who are waiting to get into the jail and they're mostly men so our women get out of the police van and all these male prisoners turn around and start heckling the women saying sexually suggestive stuff so wild man gets out after the women while the women are still getting heckled and he's coming down i don't know if they had some like little steps you have to come down in your chains and he looks like a viking mm -hmm. he's got a bit of a beard he's got his chains and he just the police are like get down the steps get down the steps and he just stops on the steps and ignores the cops and he looks at all of the men heckling the women and says stop talking shit to our women or else mm -hmm. I'll have any of you motherfuckers when we all get in that jail <laughs> and he just looks down his beard at them uh -huh. like he's gonna fucking smash their heads into toilets <laughs> as soon as he gets in there <laughs> And they all shut the fuck up. Because <laughs> you sent some emails with pictures of you and Wildman, which we'll yeah. probably be showing throughout this anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people obviously know Wildman now and had to kind of visualize what he was like as a younger man, you know? Yeah. But he was, uh, there was something quite striking about the way he looked and you say his beard and he was quite a different, there was something a bit mellow about him as he was older wasn't there whereas when he was younger I think you can those pictures you sent me you can see the wildness in both of you in a way like you've got some crazy haircuts in that there's one I think there's one photo of you with stripes shaved into your head yeah yeah that was in the rave scene in the UK that one yeah yeah did you two kind of encourage the other to be a little more out there as well do you think yes. you two encouraged we, we fed off each other mm. 
And that's how our insaneness went to such a high level. But after that insaneness and after obviously the, the criminality, if that's what you want to call it, I don't know, after what you, after what you did, did you two also reflect together on that and kind of, um, I don't know, work out how you felt about some of the wrong or some of the, the, the more... Because there's a lot of stories here where we're laughing along. Yeah. But obviously some people have come to harm in those. Yes. And did you two do reflection together on that? So Wild Man became more philosophical and started to call himself Mild Man <laughs> in recent years. And he said... He's got no regrets whatsoever. He's lived life to the fullest. And he's not an apologist. He's not gonna apologize to anyone. I do talks in schools and stuff like that. And you know, I have to go in and show the consequences of, of you know, drug taking and things like that. And my mom had a nervous break and explain all these things. So I've got all of these things that I do genuinely regret. I saw the harm that people on drugs it causes. I put people on the road of drug use. I saw the horror of that in the jail. But Wild Man was more, um, I've done these things, ain't gonna fucking look back. I'm getting on with my life. All I can do now is try and do good. And he did try and do good. A lot of people contacted him saying they were inspired by his story to get off alcohol, to get off drugs. People said they were suicidal. I've seen the messages and hearing Wild Man's story and the humor and the inspiration it gave them prevented them from killing themselves. So, he became this iconic figure that inspired people because he'd been through such a crazy life and committed these heinous acts, but mm -hmm. come out the other side and had reversed that successfully. You know, you know, looking back at his childhood and stuff like that, because we didn't, I don't know if we really got a chance to delve into that. Uh, do you think that that was part of the reason he became wild in the way he was? Good grief. So I've had to contemplate nature versus nurture in the case of wild man and i think it's so complex that you can't just nail it down to mm -hmm. one thing but perhaps the combination of him growing so big versus his other brothers his uh, um, older brother used to beat him up a lot and he used to talk about that a lot to me and perhaps the suppression of that and then he'd go out and fight bouncers. Perhaps he was angry, you know. You, when you say he used to talk about his brother beating him up, though, yeah. do you think that scarred him a little bit? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, because um, it's funny, in MMA and UFC and stuff, you see uh, some of the biggest, baddest dudes are the ones who had older brothers who used to get beaten up by those brothers, and it spurred them on to learn how to fucking fight. You know what I mean? And do you think that was sort of maybe the thinking? I think when he was going down and fighting multiple bouncers as a teenager, he probably saw his brother's, uh, his brother on, you know, think about his brother, the anger he had. Mm. That's what, but I don't want to say anything disrespectful to the family. So. No, no course, at the end yeah. of the day, that you know, I think everyone has their regrets in life and I'm sure, you know, he probably did things to his family and they did things to him and we all hurt each other at times and that's just part of it, isn't it? You've got to let that go now yeah. and remember yeah. him for who he, who he was. I just think it's fascinating to know how you end up like this because characters like Wild Man, you know, you see them on Grand Theft Auto and like you think that's ah, a bit exaggerated, isn't it? And then you meet a man like Wild Man and you're like, fucking hell. Like, it reminds me of my own dad a little bit, to be honest. My dad's a bit like this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like just the rules don't apply to him. You know, you could be walking past someone like him in the street. You wouldn't really think twice about, oh, well, you know, I could probably have him or whatever. But people like him who will bite your face off or something, you don't really know what you're getting involved with until it's too late. The rules did not apply at all. And that's how I learned during his first visit that my intention to get him a job as a wrestler was idealistic because once he got kicked out of the final apartment the one i described where we were partying at that was completely stripped of all the furniture and everything he had lit some kind of plastic in the air conditioning duct so that when the little blobs of blue plastic flame fell down they made this little <laughs> noise that soothed his red dots and he'd let fire extinguishers off in there and everything just for the hell of it. People were coming in through the windows to get drugs. It was just so out of control. The police ended up raiding that one. Um, and he um, was under, living under a tree with a stripper, taser girl, 
He ended up no. living under a, a tree with his girlfriend, who was the stripper who tasered her vagina, mm. with a Rambo knife. For those who don't know, she, she became his girlfriend, just to, sorry to interject, mate, um, when he met her at a party and she already had her boyfriend and he told the boyfriend to go, fuck off, basically. And he was Mr. Steal Your Girl, basically, that night. He, he told the guy to go and make spaghetti bolognese or something like that and then took the woman. Yeah took the woman and, and they were together then until he got deported and never been a men's society so he was living under this 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 tree they were doing like bonnie and clyde stuff just going in restaurants ordering meals fine you know steaks and just not even paying on the complete rampage and that that was how he ended up um gets deported and classified as a menace to society but it was the connections that i established through him that enabled me to build the business and, and th through when when he was in his prime what were his sort of the the most violent things that he actually carried out in that you witnessed personally or heard about if there was a situation i'd i saw him knock a few people out mm -hmm. he, he he um he had a left punch didn't he what was it left hook was it and they'd just be out like that one punch yeah but there was i was at an apartment party once and g dog was there and someone actually got the better of him. Because mm. Wildman would, he knew when a big guy was gonna punch him out. Mm -hmm. And he'd usually like sh offer to shake hands with the right and punch the big guy out with his left before the big, <laughs> but someone did it to him wow. once. Mm. Um, we was at this apartment party. I was just off my face on ecstasy, just enjoying the vibe. And it was just really chill. G Dog was in the, and I think it was like a baseball player for ASU, some jock. And this guy, he wasn't as tall as Wildman, but he was stocky and you could see he was strong. But well, he was an athlete. Strong as fuck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he came over and okie doked Wildman and punched Wildman in the head. Um, I think he might have like <laughs> pretended to be Wildman's friend, just hit him. Mm but it didn't knock Wildman out so this apartment was just full of people like wall to wall mm -hmm. and this thing broke out and it was like all I can remember feeling like I was in a wave of people and I'm on ecstasy in this wave of people and Wildman's trying to get him this way and the wave's going that way and then people are pulling Wildman back and the wave is going that way and I think G Dog pulled the gun on the guy or something, and we had to leave in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, that solves a lot of issues, though, doesn't it? G Dog yeah. could clean things up like that mm. without it escalating. He was very shrewd and streetwise. Was, was, was he the third of the, the the duo then? Yeah, he was. When he was out of prison, he was definitely the third of the duo. He was someone who I trusted with my life, and he was like the bridge into that world of. The Mexican Mafia, New mm -hmm. Mexican Mafia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wild Man had uh, just as crazy with fighting as he was with his romance. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I remember one story about, he basically says to his missus in the UK, I'm going for a paper. And then he gets on a plane for the first time in his life, by the way, he'd never flown, he'd never been on holiday. And he flies all the way to Arizona to be with you and doesn't tell her anything. He just goes away and that's it for god knows how long but when you look back at his uh, relationships with women or whatever who was it, who were his main relationships with and what were they like all right so full props and respect to his wife right now i thought wild man would spend the rest of his life in prison like he had predicted in the thinking tree mm -hmm. and once he met his wife and they moved in together he never got in trouble with the police again mm -hmm. so for her to have such a positive influence on him uh, uh, well, this was after he came back this is after he came from back. arizona yeah yeah with the newspaper luckily this is um <laughs> a, a, not wild woman this is a woman he met after mm. he got um deported the final time um so this was later on in his life then yeah this is in the last years mm. of his life yeah so going back to the wild woman was his main misses in the 1990s the late 1990s mid to late 1990s this is bonnie and clyde no no that was his stripper my bad the, the stun yeah. yeah yeah so the first time wild man came out 
he told Wild Woman that he was going to just go to the news agents and get a milk or something, a newspaper or something. Mm-hmm. And he did hook up with the Taser girl while he was in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And that became then, because Wild Woman comes later, doesn't okay, she? Okay, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so his, his first main relationship in the UK was with Wild Woman. No, actually, his first main relationship in the UK was with the mother of his daughter. All right, okay, then. So we did set up a donation page for his daughter. Mm-hmm. and um, We'll pe- put the link for that in the description. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Thank, thanks to people who've donated. I think it's raised almost three grand. Wow. Yeah. And she has just recently had um, a grandchild, so Wild Man was proud that he was a granddad. Wow. Bless him. Well, we're yeah. glad he got to see that situation play yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. What was he like as a, grand, as a granddad, do you think? I don't want to say too much because his daughter and grandchild no, want to remain anonymous yeah. and they live overseas. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he was touched that mm-hmm. he was, he was really proud of that. Really proud, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a big moment in your life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was joking. I was, I was like, I'm old now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it makes you feel old. It makes you feel old to even be a dad, let alone yeah. a granddad. So yeah, yeah that's incredible yeah. for him. Yeah. So, so that was with his first, um, his first woman in the UK. Yeah, but like he said, uh, on uh, on another interview because Wild Man's only been interviewed by two people and that's you mm. and Helen Wood and he told her and I think he may have told you as well that he wasn't ready to settle down at that young age mm. yeah. he felt trapped in a house with responsibilities and he wasn't ready to be a dad mm. the call of the wild was the so they broke up and then Wild Man got in trouble for the street robbery went to prison I'm in America working the stock market he meets wild woman and she became known as wild woman because she took out uh, an entire family in a bar fight with a chur in a pub so she became the wild woman of witness separately to him being the wild man of witness which was a name given to him by his uncle Bob so so they were all both known for that reason <laughs> and had never even met each other yet yep wow yeah, this is, then, like, this is like a weird sort of Disney fairy tale. Yeah, they were meant to be from the you start. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he saw her in a pub and asked her to get her tits out or something. <laughs> As you do. As you do. What, just on the spot, just sort of so I, good. That, I think that was one of the first things he said, so yeah. Mm. And um, they got a taxi. Wow. She was, she, she, she was like, place. he's such a dreamy <laughs> guy. Yeah. Did she get her boobs out in the pub? <laughs> I can't remember what happened. It okay. was all... Of, the, la- the, la- the romantic language they used to each other was equally um, not politically yeah. correct. Right, but I can imagine them sort of comparing the damage they've done to people before. Yeah. I have spoke to a wild woman recently on Facebook and asked if she will come on my podcast and give us her story and some wild man stories. Mm. That'd be lovely. That would really fill in some blanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You must have a lot of those considering all the drugs you did as well. Yeah, there's so... Uh, his you know every day with him was a story because he would get up to something mm-hmm. so there's just so many untold stories out there so, so Wild Woman was yeah what was their relationship like generally <laughs> this sounds terrible but how do I phrase this correctly they were both violent people and they thrived on that mm-hmm. so I would go over and I know Wild Woman wouldn't want me to not say this because I've written about it in the book she's given me permission they would have fights mm-hmm like he'd hit her she'd stab him in the belly she'd like pick up an iron and try and hit him and you know and then this, so this <laughs> what you're suggesting is this isn't a case of um, domestic abuse in regards to one party on the other and a victim no. they're both just as bad as each other here. yeah their relationship was based on domestic violence for a period of time mm. and I'd tell them both you're gonna kill each other mm. Mm. she stabbed his belly he showed me all the scars all the scars what, all the scars what with like a just pick up a knife so it, sorry she stabbed him on more than one occasion in more than one place oh this was foreplay for them and this is what I'm saying I'd go over shocked at the mayhem the destruction he'd you know thrown a, a, a boulder through a window and stuff and front windows are smashed and I said you guys have got to separate you're going to kill each other mm-hmm I was completely shocked by the levels that they took things to and they knew it stressed me the fuck out but they'd always call me over to try and clean it up so I'd separate them the sex must have been mental by the way yeah. that's what they said yeah. the it- next day they were like love you love you make up sex time so, w- and this went on and, and on you, and, and you'd on still for be years. there right you'd still be there no, right. no, I'm strangulated in the middle of this thinking how the fuck can this be <sighs> yeah 
That's is that's what good sex does, mate. It <gasps> literally keeps keeps people who are terrible for each other together for too long. <sighs> but they were tight partners in crime. If anyone went against them, they would turn on that person. Oh Jesus! And people were more afraid of her than him. Right? Yeah, mm. that makes sense as well. From what you've just yeah. said, yeah. I mean, if <sighs> if you'll stab your own boyfriend multiple times in the belly, what the fuck's she gonna do to you, pal? Yeah. She loves him. Mm. So. So they say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is who I love. Yeah, you see in the scars. So when he wasn't around, if people had money, she'd be like, oh, "Fucking come over and slit your fucking throat, motherfucker." Yeah. This is, it's a highly unusual life those two lived, though, isn't it? Like those are the kind of people where you know you hear about them in your town and you sort of go, "Definitely stay away from that family," sort of thing. You, that's quite an unusual way to live. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and but, do, but they, do you think people knew about them and were sort of scared of them, or what was their what was their reputation like? People were in awe of them, right? Because Arizona is a fast paced place where there's a lot of people trying to rip each other off, and people don't stay around for very long. But the wild mans were dominating that scene, so they were actually successful in what they were doing. You say, yeah, this is how streetwise they were when the altercation with Skinner occurred which I described in the previous Wolf of Wall Street podcast Skinner was my top sales guy mm -hmm. he was my right hand man when Wildman before Wildman came to the country and when Wildman came over Skinner got jealous of the amount of time I was spending with Wildman so things escalated with him and Wildman and Skinner coordinated a black gang to firebomb Wild Woman's apartment while wild woman was in deportation federal prison awaiting to be kicked out of the country yet again was that was there a reason for that just because 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 wild man was in in prison skinner thought he could get away with this and it was it was also set up whereby he wanted to take wild woman's pills yeah sorry i meant why was wild woman awaiting deportation no wild man sorry my bad yeah okay. he was he's in prison Okay. A federal deportation prison. So she's sitting there like a dot, basically. That's what Skinner thinks. Mm. But this is how tough she is. So she's got her pills and stuff in this place. Firebomb comes through the window, almost sets fire to her. This crew of black gangsters that Skinner has recruited show up and say, come with us. We work with Sean. Grab your shit, as in your pills. Get in the car. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you safe. Wild woman says, I don't know who the fuck you motherfuckers are. Do you think I was born fucking yesterday? I just got off the fucking banana boat. Do I look like I'm so fucking stupid? I'm going to get in the car with you motherfuckers. <laughs> and they're like, what the fuck? You know, so. It's not the normal reaction. <laughs> <laughs> the pills were not jacked, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Wild woman protected our interests. And she had her own goons as well. That, w that would do things for her. So, so she was his second main partner in his life, Wild Woman. If you, <laughs> when you say second main, the funny thing, the thing that came to mind is in the criminal conspiracy, in the crime family, the prosecutor had labeled her as number two. As in your number two? Wild Man was, they had labeled as my number three. Wow. Yeah. Because she was that important to the setup. Yeah. Wow. And they had her pegged with a hundred and... I think it was 155 felonies when all the shit went down. I think Wildman had a couple of dozen, I had a couple of dozen. She was actually like, you see, this is the thing, the women are a bit more like, I don't know, I, <laughs> women everywhere just instantly hairs, go, sorry, what? What are you going to say here? But like, I would be more scared of a woman like that than any man. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. Like women can be a bit more, a man can forgive very quickly. I feel like women are a little bit, they hold on to shit more, they're more calculated sometimes, and that can make her really effective. You know what I mean? Some yeah. people do say there's no more of an element of kamikaze in the female side, I, I think is the- I mean, um, every man who's listening now knows exactly what the fuck we're talking about when you're trying to put the brakes on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> She's going, I'll fucking make sure you are. Yeah. Well, wild man could just go in and demolish anyone. Mm. Wild woman could do that, but she also was strategic. Mm, calculated then and she would fight men yeah she would grab someone and just fucking box him in right in front of everyone and was that attractive to wild man do you think the fact that they were like violent cave people on the same wavelength that's what they got off on 
she was the female him, I suppose, in a way. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Was it a soulmate kind of relationship? Oh, yeah, they were really tight, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I suppose if you know you'll kill for each other, there's an element of closeness that comes with that, even if you're trying to kill each other in the process. But then the amount of drugs they were both on just made the behaviour ten times more extreme than wow. it probably would have been. So what, who was the next woman who came after Wild Woman? Okay, so there was Wild Woman who came and went because she had a deportation or two as well and then there was wild man had relationships with some uh, striptease women that wild woman found out about that caused many arguments and fights including the taser how, woman how did he explain that away just out of interest do you, do you remember any of the excuses he would sort of <laughs> use or so I show up and wild man would say Sean's taking me to play pool <laughs> <laughs> And Wild Woman go, you think I look like chopped fucking liver? I know you motherfuckers are going to the titty bar. Well, I'm fucking coming with you. I'm fucking getting in that car. I'm fucking coming with you. No, you're not, love. We're just going to go and play pool. Just stay right there. She should march to the fucking car and try and get in the car. Well, I was like, no, you're not coming with us. We've got to collect that. We've got to do this. And I, I just drive off and leave them to it sometimes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> But no excuse. Do you, so when he when she did find out, was he the kind of guy to go, mm -mm, or was he just like, yeah, you caught me? Oh yeah, he didn't hide anything when he was found out. He was always honest about <laughs> like everything that. to anybody. I do like that. I think it is important yeah. when you bank right, just take it like a man. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. What? Uh, so the, in terms of relationships, though, who was the next relationship he had after <laughs> after her? All right. So he had the liaisons with the striptease women, but the main relationships he had with, in his life were the mother of his baby, wild woman. And then his wife when he came back after okay. his final deportation. And that seemed like a completely different situation to everything before that. Yeah. Was that a bit more warm and loving and soft? Completely. Yeah. And I think he reflected in prison that he would just spend the rest of his life in prison if he kept up that behavior. Okay. All he did then was drink and smoke weed. Once he got out that final time, he, and he, 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 you know, he didn't. He never went to pubs because he knew he would get in fights, okay. and then he knew he would get back in prison. Mm -hmm. So a lot of indoors. He bit just of a stayed hermit. home. Just stayed a bit home. Of a hermit, Complete yeah. hermit. Yeah. What was the the effects of alcohol and weed from versus everything before that? Did was it a lot softer by comparison? In, oh yeah, because I'm yeah. crystal meth. He's been up for days, and I, it was hard for me to steer his behavior away from self-destruction yeah. and him getting arrested mm. um i'll give you one example so i had a bouncer called rossetti it was a big guy big strong guy and i would tell him all these stories about peter and he'd be like oh you must be making all this you must be making all that no he's gonna get here eventually we're bringing him back you you wait and see so when peter came they both came to my house on the mountainside in Tucson and Rosetti said, Peter was just picking me up and throwing me around like I'm a rag dog. I can't believe how strong he is. Mm -hmm. And in the night, that night, Peter went off into um, the hills where there was the rattlesnakes and the cactus. And the next day, we just found Peter asleep on the porch like a bird with his top off, completely covered in cactus spines. And the sun's coming down over the desert. And there's big burr figures there with all these cactus spines. And me and my wife are pl plucking all the cactus spines out of, his, out of his body. But to get to the point I'm making about him out of control on meth. So me and Rossetti were driving home from a rave. And Wild Man's in the back seat. And I'm looking in the mirror. And his eyes are just the devil just pure red and he's just looking at me in the in the car mirror i'm thinking something's not quite right here so looking over at rossetti looking back at well man looking back in the mirror he's just still looking at me not blinking i said is everything okay peter he's like no <laughs> so what's the matter peter i know what you're up to fucking hell i look at rossetti like, what the fuck? And he said, what are we up to, Peter? I know too much. You guys are taking me out to the desert right now. So I'm thinking, if he thinks we're taking him out to the desert, he's about to do something to us, mm. to prevent us taking him out to the desert. 
so I'm like Peter calm down we're your best mates we love you we're not taking you out to the desert you've done too much meth and that's where Xanax came in really handy <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just we had to dose the fuck out of him on Xanax so many times when he got like that, just to prevent him from doing destruction. Yeah, while woman would dose the fuck out of him on Xanax as well. You know when he came back to the UK and obviously he's not on that level of drugs anymore. Yeah. Uh, did you find he compensated for the the old ways by overdoing it on alcohol and weed, or do you think it's a sad thing because? I had to address my inner turmoil and my addiction issues and I learned to recycle my energy from negative stuff into positive addictions. Mm -hmm. But Wild Man was never able to shake completely his addiction issues. He substituted the hardcore stuff for drinking every single day. Mm. And that's what did him in, one of the factors. Yeah, we see the younger photos of him. And mm. Obviously, he was always a big man, but he became a huge man later on. And do you think the alcohol was probably one of the reasons? <sighs> Completely. So he said the reason he wanted to do the podcast with me in the beginning was to make money to buy beer and cider. He just said it jokingly, you know. Mm -hmm. But every time we did podcasts... On, when I was dropping him off back at home, he would make me stop at Bargain Booze mm -hmm. and he'd go in and buy tons of beer and cider. And I remember I went into Bargain Booze with him once and either the size of the multi-liter cider bottle had been reduced or the price had gone up and his eyebrow went up mm -hmm. and he looked at the poor woman behind the counter and he's like, what the price? What the fuck? The, the, the price has changed. And he looked like he was going to kill this woman as well. Explained what had happened. Wow, it looked like, like he was going to kill her. And, um, but over time, because I think we've been doing podcasts for a couple of years, the YouTube videos a couple of years with Wildman on the channel. Over time, I noticed the deterioration of his, of his health because Wildman started to say, when you um, take me to Bargain Booze, I need you to park on the handicapped spot because I can't walk very well mm -hmm. and his dog had died and I wanted to get him a new dog to get him walking again but just going in mobile and sat there drinking that was like the final things then that led led. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to talk about for you mate understand mm. it's hard to think about as well because he's he's always been a mountain of a man such yeah, a strong guy yeah, the most yeah. feared man in the room but in terms of the alcohol I've, I've been there a bit myself you know there's times where I've used it to numb pain and um, I, you know people look down on people who do that but they shouldn't because we've all been there we've all felt pain and sometimes you just can't you can't carry on without something it's alright mate he's not in any pain anymore though and that's what you need to remember. You know why we're on it, actually. Um, I remember about a year ago, I was drinking quite a lot. You know what I mean? And, and you think to yourself, fucking hell. I, you know, I can see how people end up carrying on like this. You know, because I was smashing the booze in us. And you think to yourself, if you can't pull yourself out of that, it's the only way. I keep thinking, oh, what could I have done to save them? <laughs> Keep thinking I should have been up there, but he won't fucking listen to me. Could have got him in the dog and everything. Meet you offered everything. Forced him to go into hospital. He just kept joking about it. But my brain in the last few weeks has been going over and up, thinking what could I have done. Sean. You know that there's not a man alive on this planet who could tell that man what to do. That's no true. one, not even you, mate. That's true. He loved you as much as he loved anyone. That's true, yeah. But he did what he wanted when he wants, and there was no rules for him. Yeah. There's nothing you could have done or said, mate. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying this to alleviate your guilt, because it's the truth. I'm not a bullshitter. I wouldn't just say this to make you feel better. It's the truth, mate. Yeah. Even remember when we did the podcast with him, just getting him to do a podcast. 
You know, he's, he wasn't a controllable. Like, everything had to be what he wanted. You know what I mean? He was, he was, that, that's who he was. Yeah. He lived by his own rules and you have to respect that as well. If he wanted to get pissed every day, unfortunately, that there was no going to stop him. I was speaking to him every week, man, and he just mm. joked and said he was okay. Mm. I said, it's fucking serious, Peter. You could die. He's like, I've seen the doctors have done everything they can. They can't put me in the hospital because of corona. <sighs> yeah. You did the most for him. You did a lot that you could for him. Yeah. Mate, him getting up and going and doing that podcast with you must have been one of the most fun things that could have happened to him at that period of his lifetime. You've oh, he loved it. He loved exactly. it in the podcast. He did. But that, but for him, it could have been quite easily for him to just disappear into a man who used to be something. Mm. And, you know, the stories in the pub yeah. are one thing, but really it becomes a bit of a, a guy, oh, I used to have this. And now he's still someone because of everything you've done. And, yeah. uh, and he got a lot of enjoyment out of that. And it became like a... I don't know something later on in his life to enjoy and have you know what I mean where a lot of people don't get that they they become yesterday's hard man and that's the end of them really and it didn't happen to him like that he was so proud that he had over a million views on his True Jody podcast mm. you get telling me Bless there's him. a very limited club of people who have that actually <laughs> It him and KSI it started to rise it must have started to rise and, all of a sudden in like mm. this year because he kept going on about it but, mate, it's I'm pretty sure it's him KSI and a porn star <laughs> that probably got the top he's so. an elite club and yeah. I mean that he really is and he's prettiest of the three as well if I'm honest when over a million people <laughs> when, when over a million people care about you know what he's got to say that speaks volumes you know what I mean he was a fascinating guy I think that's the difficult part isn't it when someone's first gone in your life and it can feel like they've not you don't you feel such a a, a loss that it feels like you know they're gone but he really left a mark on well more than one mark on this world I think that's you really helped him do that yeah you know yeah I think there's over 100 videos on his playlist and a lot of them he interviewed like people he idolized when he was a kid like Brian Cockle the tax man who was one of the most feared and the strongest guys in the country and um, Brian was like to the end Brian was like call, calling him up and telling it trying to coach him on health matters and stuff like that so to have this relationship with a guy he idolized as a kid um, was really important to him he ended yeah. up with quite different interviews as well I think didn't he like obviously the, it's all well and good us going oh yeah tell us about your stories but when you're sitting opposite someone who you know is just as bad as you I think you open up in a different way don't you and you op you, I don't know you almost want to impress them in a way I think I felt like whenever I watched his stuff they wanted to impress him they wanted to you know yeah yeah because he's they, you can just look in his eyes and see he's the real deal he's been through it mm and other people have been through things there's a mutual respect because I noticed when I was asking questions of some guys when Wildman sat there when it's like the real gangster stuff they're like in a zone with each other Wildman and the they big speak guy their in language. A, in a, yeah, yeah yeah they're on that that wavelength aren't they like real recognised real it's the old yeah, saying isn't it yeah completely. and they know it yeah, yeah. Other well, dogs look at him and go, "You're a dog as well." Aren't you? you know what I mean? We've not, we've not really covered. There's a long time of his life where he was in prison. Yeah. Of course. What was? Yeah. He, well, how did he find that? Because being a wild man, you know, you're not really controllable. That must have been difficult, really difficult for someone like that. So you asked me about funny stories, and I've got some funny ones. Mm. So in the very beginning, then May 2002, we were all arrested and put in Towers Jail. But the prosecutors got do not house together on me and Wildman, so we're in separate towers. But we are allowed to go to the church together. Um, wow, this is like prison break, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really is, isn't it? How the fuck did they let you anyway near each other after that? Let me set the table for this. There's, there's a, these people called Church on the Street, lovely people. There was Pastor Walt, and there was Hillbilly Bill with his little banjo. And every now and then there was um, Hillbilly Ed, sorry, I think it was. There was Jumping Bill who would come in. And Jumping Bill was just this, this bald guy with glasses and a Jesus t shirt. And he'd come in with his guitar and all the, he'd tell the prisoners to all start pogo dancing. And the, it freaked the guards out. And he'd run up and down the roads just beaming and smiling in people's faces. So we're at church on the street one time. Or oh, was it Catholic Mass? Was it, it might have been Catholic Mass? 
we would sit in the back rows with the Italian Mafia guys that we were clicked up with. And Wildman could not whisper. <laughs> so we're trying to like, you know, update our cases and everything, what's going on. And Wildman's voice is just so loud. He had a booming voice. Yeah. So in church on the street, Pastor Walt would be like, it stopped the, it stopped the mass, he'd be like, in the end times predicted in the Bible revelations, there will be mockers and scoffers. And right now there are mockers and scoffers on the back row. And he'd walk right up to wild man. And he was like, you guys gotta shut up. And I'm like, wild man, you gotta learn to whisper. So Catholic mass, we're, in, we're on the back row having a whisper. The priest comes out and does Holy Communion. And some people are very religious in these services. I mean, the front row, they're all tatted out with like Jesus and Mary tattoos and stuff. And there are already, you know, because wild man's whispering, some of the, the more devout are already turning around and going, shut up, you shut the fuck up, trying to, trying to get him to shut up. He doesn't care. <laughs> but the priest comes up and gives wild man communion. As soon as the priest turns around, he takes it out of his mouth, puts it on his eye like he's a pirate with an eye patch. He goes, ha, 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 look at me, everyone, look at me. I worship the devil. And then he grabs the communion. The priest by now has almost walked to the front of the room. He launches the communion like a frisbee. And he's already got the entire room to turn around and look at him. He launches this communion like a frisbee and it's like chick, 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 chick. Everybody's heads go like this and it skims the roof. <laughs> it comes down and hits the priest perfectly in the back and rolls on the floor. <laughs> and he's just like, I am the devil. <laughs> I, bet, I bet you there was a few killers not really impressed. With <laughs> well, some of these Italian mafia guys that we clicked up to, they were really religious as well. And some of them moved seats away from him. Mm. And this one you know when the, ma the Italian mafia are like, I'm just going to give him, I'm going to give him a wide berth, mm. you know, <laughs> like. A bit much for them. Yeah, that bit must have been weird for them though. You've got to remember like, this is this broad English accent But guy. the goons were loving it. One yeah. of the goons I was really tight with and he was like, yeah, well, man's everything you said and more. Yeah. Fucking, I love this guy. <laughs> but do you remember how it made you feel in that time? Because are you, so are you feeling like you're looking at a guy who's shouting, I am the devil. Yeah. And obviously you've known him for years, but how, how do you feel in that moment? I feel that I've got the craziest motherfucker in this jail as my soul brother. Everybody here knows that. And they're not going to be looking at me to drop the soap in the fucking shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good show. Right. Safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people say, how oh, did you survive this shit? You know, well, wild man's a good person to get arrested with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God for a mess. Ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or the devil. Yeah. 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 You did a talk recently. Was this the first one back since uh, the passing? You went to the school. Did you manage that or not? Okay. So since Wellman's death, I have not done any events or any um, videos. Yesterday, I did a Zoom talk. How was it? Because Wildman isn't in the content it was okay i got through it if i would have been talking about him that might have triggered mm. is the plan to continue with the road that you were going down and you know because there was talk of a tv show and all that are you still feeling that you want to do that because i know he would want you to continue with all this wouldn't he yeah definitely so my plan is well because of the lockdown my business model has changed mm. people are at home watching videos reading books so I've really focused on YouTube. It's like it's completely taken over my life. Mm. It's, it's, it's the growth there that I've been focusing on and just lining up good podcast guests and keeping the content coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was doing like a live stream at night at one point and a video in the morning and stuff. It was me mental, wasn't it? It was yeah. like so much content. Yeah. yeah. Um, you guys do a video every now and then and get massive amounts of hits. Mm -hmm. Thanks. To keep up with your your kind of view level, um, I'm doing over five million a month right now, which is fantastic, by the Free, way. For yeah. those who don't know YouTube numbers, yeah. that's amazing. 
That and is amazing. Not only that, but it's amazing mainly because YouTube's probably restricting quite a lot of that content as well because of yeah. what's in the videos. Yeah, you're not a... a Morning, guys! <laughs> you're not even a monetizable guy because of the kind of stories that are being told. So to get those views, you're doing amazingly well. Well, a lot of it is demonetized. And since I started to go into the realm of exposing child sex abuse and trafficking at the elite level i've just come under a huge amount of attacks on my channel and people mm. trying to take me down what kind of attacks yeah. are we talking about so the trolling has just built up and up and up i was doing live streams for a company mm -hmm. and i had a co-host a brilliant woman called sonia poulton who exposes Peter Files in Parliament, she's got a documentary out. She's done a lot, lot of work on Madeleine McCann. I've seen her talk about Jimmy Savile before. Jimmy like Savile, that. really yeah. dynamic. And I really enjoyed doing those live streams. We were at the forefront of an information revolution, I believed. And it really had crazy momentum. But then numerous things accelerated against us, which stopped our partnership and she has gone on the record recently and said she has researched this and she believes that our black ops agent provocateur level ops against us trying to stop all this information from getting out of there okay so just to unpack that for people who aren't yeah. as um you know educated as what you mm. are on this sort of stuff yeah what what we're suggesting here is you were pushing a few too many buttons at a high level because you're talking about you know, you were one of the, I'd say you were the number one guy for the Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, we've uh, got the channel with the most Epstein videos, over 400 videos. Yeah. So you research stuff and, and that is linked to the, the highest levels of government in America and, and other, other places. And what you're saying is you were pro probably prodding a little bit too deep to a point where certain people could then spend money to send traffic your way um, bots or what, whatever you know fake trolls and all of these people who were there to just purely make life as hard as possible for you to do that yeah and to completely destroy my credibility mm -hmm. but I did a distasteful prank which did arm the opposition with fuel to come after me and mm -hmm. that was a mistake yeah. okay so explain this because obviously I'm kind of aware of it but a lot of people might not be well, I'm glad you are allowing me to explain this, Brian and Lawrence, because I've been under legal instruction not to talk about this since it happened by the company that I was doing the live streams for. Mm. And that company, they said, what we want you to do is get grilled by your co-host and admit to everything and don't try to defend your actions and this will blow over we're going to suspend you for now this will blow over but then we're going to hire you back in november mm -hmm. which didn't happen so i did as they said they said you know we're media experts mm. you need to listen to the us and do this we're going to relaunch you we're going to do a, a program called atwood unleashed and you'll be back even stronger than ever so against my better judgment because the alarm bells were going off in my head mm. I did what they said and I just admitted to everything and I never tried to defend myself and I just said, look, but, to, but we've got to go over exactly what happened okay. for you to fully understand so this. I, I want to help you through this so yeah. that you can explain yeah. it clearly because obviously there's so many thoughts going on and you, you've, got, you've been through quite a lot there by the sounds of it. So going back, you're uncovering things and people are trying to prod holes in your credibility. They're saying things about you. Now, from what I remember, there was a woman who was a part of the YouTube channel, or she you'd you'd help rescue her from a tough situation. Yeah, and she was was she living with you or was she around you a lot? Okay, so the prank was a joint effort by me and one of my podcast guests. Okay, and my podcast guest name is Callie. Okay, and she suffered a horrendous story of abuse she was molested i think by an uncle at age four mm -hmm. she got heavily into drugs she didn't have the tools to deal with what had happened to her and then she was trafficked and classified by the home office as a victim of modern day slavery and human trafficking mm -hmm. and i've got the home office paperwork right 
right here. Just just the front page is all you need to see. Albert. On you there. Those? You right? Yeah. Cheers, bud. So he always comes well briefed, which I do like. I had well wow, never okay. interviewed someone who it was active. So Callie came to me two years before I actually um, did the filming with her, and she told me this story. And I said, look, this is so dangerous what you're telling me and what you're going through. If we put something on camera, I think that this is gonna make things even worse for you. These traffickers might come and kill you. So I thought about her over time. And then this year she sent me another message and said, things are so bad. I just feel that if I don't put my story on the internet, I am gonna get killed and I really wanna do it. And I said, well, you've had two years to think about it. If you're that confident enough to come and, and do it, let's do it. So I interviewed her four times and I set up a donation page for her because she was homeless and injecting cocaine. And I've lived with people who, for six years who were injecting drugs and I know how hard it is for those people and a lot of them people think they're just drug addict scum they're out shoplifting and prostituting uh, what, they've got nothing coming why, why even help them and um, after living with the people for six years in prison and hearing the sad stories of abuse this was a female equivalent to that and I thought I could make a difference in her life and I just want to say that the We've, we've all you know we have a laugh at the wild man stories yeah. and all the drug stories that you but you have turned a corner and you really are trying to make things better for people who are struggling with drugs and other yeah, things yeah. Like that. some money was coming in from the donation pages and I was able to get her hotels and stuff she didn't have a bank account but I was helping her get the money so, to, 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 so she wasn't homeless and then she got she got raped and robbed in one place and um, how did that happen was that was she sort of in the wrong place okay one of the one of the criticisms that i've had for raising money for her is that she's a sex worker she's got a page on a website called adult work Mm -hmm. and she it's she's advertised at over a thousand pounds a night and she's saying she's got horses and all of this stuff and why would i how why on earth would i want to raise money for someone like that well my response to that is that is all complete front these sex workers and i've met a few of them now through Cali, they live sad lives of borderline homelessness and drug, drug addicted desperation. And um, for people to hate on sex workers because they're like fronting it to try and hustle a bit of money together. It's really sickening. And to see the absolute hatred that's come in over this. So I helped to get a place in Brighton and because she's like street level and doing things with street people street people ended up robbing her the meager money that she got put together and she said she was sexually assaulted the, Guilf- the Guilford Council said asked me if I would house her for a few days mm-hmm. so I said yeah they were going to try and find her a house but they never did she come to my house and um, I went to bed how did you feel about that just doubt it, you know because obviously she's struggling she yeah. is a drug addict she's obviously a sex worker mm-hmm. and a lot of people wouldn't have taken her in so credit to you for that but how are you feeling going to sleep that night knowing that she's there are you feeling comfortable worried? because i've been around dangerous situations i didn't think anything of it mm-hmm. and the other thing is she is really tough she's got a lovely personality she's got a very sick sense of humor i called her mini wild man and she was on the phone a lot with wild man in in the in the last of, of the months and he he loved her too because she had such a sick sense of humor mm. they were always just ripping the piss out of me all the time <laughs> together um so i felt if it was fine so she helped herself to a bottle of wine while i was asleep and helped herself to a couple of bottles of night nurse and um comes running in the bedroom punching herself in the head mm. and punching herself and dropping on the floor and headbutting the floor so I'm thinking holy shit you know I thought I was doing a good deed this woman's crazy she's about to really fucking hurt herself mm-hmm. or it might look like I've hurt her I need to call emergency services right now and document this and get her help in case she does seriously hurt herself. So I, you know, I was in shock seeing this, Mm. picked up the phone in the living room and I said, look, 
I've got a person here right now who is punching themselves in the head and this person needs serious you know, medical help. Please, can you send someone out? She comes running in the living room and says, don't fucking call the cops on me. Because she had issues of trust issues with the authorities and stuff. I said, and I said, I'm not calling the cops. She goes, you're calling the cops. I might as well fucking die. And then she launched herself over my fucking balcony. But I had just enough time to fucking grab her and stop her. She was going over and I'm on the second floor. Mm. So now I'm in double shock. I've just seen a woman punching herself in the head and headbutting the floor. And now I've just seen a woman try and kill herself right in front of me. Mm-hmm. So the woman, the operator on the phone this says- This is after all the podcasts and everything, is it? Or is this- This is after the four podcasts. Right. The operator then So she said, never showed any signs of this in those podcasts. This is no. this quite a, a new thing? This is just blown up. Mm. She's drank a bottle of wine and a couple of bottles of night nurse and this is just blown up okay. now. Her demons are coming out mm-hmm. big time. So the operator says, this is not a medical matter. This is now a police matter. We're sending the police. So I'm like, we'll just send someone ASAP because she needs help. So cops come and um, they talk to her. They talk to me. I say, look, I don't press any charges or anything because she wrecked a few, you know, things were a bit wrecked. She jumped on me in the bed and all this stuff. And um, can she just get mental health assistance? That's what she needs, obviously. So they assured me that they would take it and she would get mental health assistance. And the next day, a policewoman called me. They said she's about to be released. If I were you, I would never have anything to do with her. I know her, her history, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 10 minutes le- later. So the mental health assistance was non-existent then? That's what Callie told me later on. 10 minutes later, I get a call from Callie saying, um, I'm on the roadside, I'm homeless. And I had to make a decision then as well as health or not. But in the meantime, I'd done a video and put it on YouTube and say, because people were in- engaged, mm-hmm. they donated, they wanted to know what was happening. I put a video on YouTube. I was all shocked and shook up mm-hmm. saying, she's just tried to kill herself at my apartment. And, I remember um, saying that. Yeah. And if I'm honest, I thought, you've, you've not played this well. Like it, 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 as a viewer, you're like, what the fuck? Sure. We, were, we were about to do True News that day, I think, weren't we? And we were just looking over YouTube and your video was we, top on both of our feeds. I was just concerned about what was going on because in my head yeah. I felt like all the wildness, all the craziness for you was in the past and it's now in your books and now you're talking about it. But you're a good guy. You're trying to help the kids. You're trying to get people off of drugs. And now it, it felt like you'd lost control of this situation. Completely. Yeah. Completely lost control. I was in shock. Mm. And so... People expressed their support, more donations came in. And then now we've got to get to the motive behind the prank. So for perhaps over a year now, a hermaphrodite troll has been doing videos. (laughs) Let him finish, let him finish. Sorry. A hermaphrodite troll has been doing videos about various of my podcast guests really mean videos and these podcast guests have been contacting me every week or every month saying you need to do something about this sean this okay. was this was the hermaphrodite that um wild man fell asleep when we were interviewing her because i said i'm not scared of my trolls i'll interview my trolls and she came on the podcast mm. i thought right if it would diffuse the situation with the troll we'll get her on the podcast hear her story and maybe she'll you know be a nice person because the people that she was doing the videos out were activists about child sex abuse a lot of them so why what was the motivation then all right so she so all these people start contacting me saying you need to do something about it interviewing the troll did not stop the troll the troll in, in actually started to attack victims of pedophilia i'm really confused all right first question yeah what is a hermaphrodite again um Sort of mixed and yeah, mixed organs. male and female characteristics. Right, so, okay. Um, okay. I so I, I just because there's bound to be someone else in the audience. So I think she's got mostly male characteristics, but she has a womb. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this has been ongoing. You, you've you've got your situation with uh, Kali. So the troll started before Kali. Sorry, but but when when you interviewed the troll, yeah, this was before Kali, way before Kali. So you interviewed her way before Kali, yeah. And and how was the interview? Was it? I mean, obviously, oh, well, while I'm asleep, asleep, so, so it's it wasn't the most scintillating. But, but it was the purpose of the interview for her to get off her chest what she disliked about you, or was it for another reason? What? No, I thought right. I'm, I wanted to show Pete the world I'm not afraid of trolls. Mm. 
And by having this troll on, she was an ex-police person. She's probably got an interesting story. All the ex-police people I've interviewed, absolutely fascinating stories. Just like criminals have got fascinating stories. It's the other side of it, isn't it? Of course, yeah. So I thought this person will come on, tell a story, and maybe it will cause some kind of unity between us, and the trolling will stop. How do you approach her, though? Because when you're saying trolling, trolling is, you know, it's often just insults. Is she... In just it mindlessly insulting you or is she being critical of you and if she was to give her side of the story and I'm just trying to play them up yeah, yeah. it, would she go well actually I was just being critical of him because he wasn't doing a good job or what, whatever yeah. or, is that what she would say sort of thing she was making videos about victims of paedophilia saying that they were making it up just to do GoFundMe's and these people, people I'd interviewed, just absolutely heartbreaking, harrowing stories. So when it went from the level of she just attacking my podcast guests, attacking victims of paedophilia, the calls to do something about this were starting to resound in my mind. Now, with Callie's situation, she said that the GoFundMe was a scam and that I was on the first floor of an apartment, not the second floor. She couldn't possibly have tried to commit suicide off my first floor. And that the GoFundMe, because it was going in my name on the GoFundMe page, Callie wasn't getting any of that money. I was pocketing all of that money myself. And she was also saying that child services should be contacted to have Callie's child taken away from her. This was after enough GoFundMe money had come in for us to help Callie get a place to live out of and she had been reunited with her son. All right, so... So now the the, the, the attacks in my mind are getting really close to home. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, right, I really need, need to do something about this then. So what was your, what was your thought process behind what you were going to do? Okay, so we decided to just... Because, oh yeah, she'd accused me of setting up a trafficking operation i was back on drugs i was snorting cocaine and trafficking women this was all said in a video I yeah, yeah i was i was snorting cocaine and pimping cali out okay that's what i was doing and uh, am i right in saying that other people also picked up on this information and started making their own videos as well so there became yes other people basically falsely started to accuse you of things that weren't yes. true because yes. Yeah, because th- th- there were a few, a few people. I can't understand why they would think that. Though, where, where would that come from? I don't. Under- I, you know, like you're an author. Mm-hmm. You are doing research for the Jeffrey Epstein case. You're making all these videos. You're doing school talks. Like from all the years I've known you, from day one, I've never thought there's a man who's money hungry right. and is on drugs. You've never ever acted that way. You've never, you've never been money hungry. The best. An easiest way to discredit people is to attach some kind of sex offence to them. Mm. Because even if it's disproven, it stays, doesn't there's it? always some mm. kind of... Yeah, I, so I, I hate no that in society. Is what they say, yeah. I, I hate that we, the minute a label is given by anyone like that to anyone, it doesn't matter how little evidence or how ridiculous it is, it just stays and you're fucked for life. It's, yeah. It's a shame. And it also so, reduces the other people who actually do do terrible absolutely. sexual things, yeah. which is kind of what we're seeing now with the people you're yeah. researching. So okay. I'm, ex- I'm exposing all that stuff. Mm. And then these f- four dark forces are, conspire against me to try and take my channel down. But then I armed them, gave them some ammunition with the prank, which was distasteful and it was a mistake. And I do regret it. And I apologize to anybody who was offended so, by so it. What, what I want to ask though about this prank is, I'm assuming you're sat in the living room with Kali after rescuing her again from homelessness. Was that how you two came up with it? Okay, so the prank um, was planned and built up over a period of months. And we thought that if we leak stuff from my apartment to the troll, then... (laughs) the troll will think they've got this scoop and all this inside information about me and post it. But if we do like a video showing how we leaked all this stuff to the troll, then everybody will... will You're trying to ruin their credibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they're trying to ruin your credibility because what you're trying... 
what, long story what you're trying to do is actually take down the sex offender so if they turn you into a sex offender then they're trying to take you so you're right. trying to make them yeah. look stupid so we had to do this in a way that the troll would not know that we were leaking this information to mm. her so photos and content was taken in my apartment and it looks like hidden camera sort of stuff doesn't it someone sort of holding a phone yeah. on their lap or you know yeah yeah for that and some of it was taken by me and, and, and Kelly also had some other people uh, taking content now we started by leaking some pictures and we put them on Callie's adult work site because we knew be watching. that a girl a woman that I'd been seeing um, earlier this year would snitch us out why is that because she doesn't like you no more yeah and this woman my friends call the arse rapist wow because um, you guys are very creative with your names because from the day we, we met uh, she had grand designs on my bum that i was unaware of what and these things involved <laughs> plastic going in the trailer these things involved plastic arms with fists as big as yours brian they involved a industrial strength sex machine um sorry industrial sex what, 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 what? fake sperm speculums and uh, on and on I could go boy. industrial strength so, sex so, machine so, so. I've never heard such a phrase it, it, I mean when, either no I mean, I'm sure Sean it, your yeah. podcasts are always wow wow but, wild but this is this is you know what I mean like? yeah yeah well I've never I'm sorry so, so can you industrially fuck someone as opposed to just oh, residentially so with it, she, she wanted to use these things on you I didn't know at the time but she'd read Party Time my book in which I'm not shy about having uh, I think me and my wife in LA ha at DJ Kyoki's house had mini vibrating eggs in our bums uh -huh. yeah. and I'm not shy about the G anal G-spot in it mm -hmm. so she'd read Party Time and set her sights on me because this was her specialty when you say it was a specialty so you're saying she'd done Sean, this to you other... don't help yourself sometimes right? yeah I'm just going to put that out there I think <laughs> what? you're it, I didn't know what she had in mind. Well, no, I'm, but I just this, this way, Brian, wait sure. for your book. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm, Jesus. I, I'm just not sure that you're sort of reading the signs. No, yeah. You know it's, I mean? yeah. There's times when you, when you meet a woman who <laughs> is on the kinkier side, mm. as we all know I have, um, the signs are there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So we, you know, you were just completely... <laughs> all right, so she sent me an email mm. and she said, I've read your book, Party Time. Mm. Here's some pictures of me. Oh, there we go then. She was a beautiful blonde Czech woman, mm -hmm. 39 years old, into Czech. her sports and fitness. And, and a lot of other things. <laughs> yeah. Am I right? Plenty of fists, am I right? <laughs> she said, do you want to meet? I said, yeah, let's meet. Dating website, plenty of fists. So, so, so I need to help we, we hooked up briefly. And I say briefly, it was over a month or so. I was seeing her about once a week. And it had to end because of her. I realized what she was and the, the damage that was occurring to my bum. Okay, okay. There was two times I left her with my bum bleeding. Wow. So wait. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we... Um and she, but she, wait, wait, yeah. Wait, 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 yeah. It's not the first week. We need to, first week. I, 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 I mean this in the most insensitive way. We need to unpack this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, that night, oh you're obviously you're headed round, or she's headed round to yours with the uh, ice yeah. in a bag. Uh, or a suitcase, a box. probably, yeah. Uh, AI well, sex dolls and, and everything. And, and sex dolls. And she's, AI sex dolls. She's, she's, oh, what, like those, <laughs> what, the ones that are sitting there and like talk to you? Right. <laughs> okay, so you're still getting your kicks then, Sean. Fair play to you. Fair play to you. And as you should, mate, uh, no age should uh, uh, <sighs> sexual exploration stop. Uh, between no. Two consenting adults. Just yeah. to be, uh, she uh, was consenting and you were uh, as well. Uh, as naughty as this is, she was, there's she nothing was wrong with it. laying it down what was going to happen. So the first time I go to see it, we have normal sex. It's mm. brilliant. She gets a finger in. I'm fine with that. But then she starts saying little things like, we're going to have to make this bigger. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and then she starts, that... show, she starts showing me her dildo and, and collection and stuff. Mm. With How many dildos big... are we talking? Oh, a houseful. <laughs> <laughs> she spent more on this stuff than her rent. Right. Jesus. Literally. So it's as a bit I of, quickly learned. So it's a bit of an obsession for her. Then, yes. It comes across that way. Yes. Yeah. And towards the end of it, she said to me that um, she she confessed that she was on the adult had been on the adult work site, and she specialised in torturing men's bums. Right. I thought this was a Gymshark sponsor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she was fucking adult oh, work, getting all the yeah. clicks. She said she sits around all day 
thinking up ways to torture men's bums. Wow. And her specialty was people pay 500 to a grand they'd fly in she'd go to the hotel room bitch slap them throw them around throw them in the shower make them do an anal douche and then terrorize the assholes and then tell them she'd tell them to fuck off back home but she would she said her, one of her add-on services was cookies and she'd mail them shit cookies and then they would pay hundreds of pounds for those so shookies you <laughs> But this is the thing. She's getting paid to do this. Shitty. This is her sort of business. Yeah. Why does she want to carry on doing it in her personal life? That's what. Okay, so I did not know. She got a kick. From she's me. she's dropping these hints like I, bigger things need to go in there. I've got this sex machine. Let me get the sex machine now. And these so red she, flags. I, you need, not. I need the description of this machine. Did she get the machine out? Yeah. Right. right. T- t- describe it. Because <laughs> I'm I've never as as experienced as I am, Lawrence. I've You've never, never used a I've, sex machine. I've never even seen one. An industrial strength. I feel so naive. Yeah, me too now. Brian, Lawrence, I thought I was a man of the world. Yeah. And I'd experienced everything. Mm. I'd experienced nothing. Yes. I'm imagining like a fridge Mm. with a a dildo on the side. Every time I left her house, I called Hammy right away, wild man's cousin. Mm. He's like, what's she done? What's happened? What's happened now? He'd never heard these things as well. And it was him who came up with the name for her, the the arse rapist. Mm. Creative guy. Quite an, uh, yeah. So the sex machine. About as big as this chest. There's a chest box. Roven, just frame that up for us. Big Thanks, as mate. This, big mm. as this chest over here. Yeah. Jesus. And it had various... So I'm just going to say, if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, mm. the chest is a, about a meter long and yeah. it's built. It's, do you, if it's you, massive. Yeah, if there's any... You remember old films where they sort of cart big chests onto a train when the rich family are going on a holiday? It's, like it's about that. that size. And then if, if you... Did it make it, a lot of noise or... Oh, let me tell you. So it had various tubes on the top of it. Right. Okay. Which for like mounting that. a dildo, I'm guessing. Yes! Right. For mounting various dildo attachments. Right. So she had a whole set of attachments that just fit upon the sex machine. Right. The sex machine then plugged into a wall. And if you've ever been at a it's rave... It's not battery powered, is it? <laughs> if you've ever been at a rave and you, you've wanted to get right up to the speaker that's vibrating the most. Wow. This, the whole room. The whole room was Her vibrating must have such a life yeah they, I mean to be fair you could think it's a washing machine I'm sure the screaming probably <laughs> got in the way but uh, some people just love the washing I, I can't wait to see a photograph of this woman by the way you must have one I need oh, to know I'm not allowed you, to show any no, photographs okay. I'm, I'm not being funny fuck the audience I need to see yeah, what Brian you look like yeah. yeah. this is mental privately so, yeah okay so so being the uh, open minded explorational guy that you are you, right. you, you give it a will mm. so she says to make your ass bigger because the sex machine's vibrating at such a frequency if you sit on these various things right. it'll kind of slowly enlarge it <laughs> oh, mm. so it didn't work for me mm. I only Bless you know I'm, I'm down with the anal G spot with a finger in there or something but I don't want my ass fucking made into a, made into a cavern yeah <laughs> <laughs> Jesus where the Beatles started what a podcast and I'll be driving home with shit falling out mm. so all right, so make cookies out of it. Mm. <laughs> so she goes, "All right, we'll 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 try the speculum. I'll do it on my pussy first. Right, I've seen these in porn before. So this what is, is a, a metal speculum? thing that sort of you jam in and then you open it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. like what? Well, that's like a medical thing. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it's whatever you want it to be. Apparently. Wait, sorry. She, oh. she goes, "I'll do it on my pussy first. Jesus. So she gets on the bed and does the speculum thing. Now, this is not... They're sort of made for vaginas, though, aren't they? So This has gone beyond, like, sex for me now. This is just, like, curiosity now. I'm not getting turned on. I'm just thinking, what is she going to come up with next? This is just... I'm just curious how far this woman will go. How extreme is, she will go. This is the next book, really. Killed the cat, yeah. didn't it? So. so she's on the bed with the speculum. I've never seen anything like it. This looks like cavernous pink walls, and you can just see all the way in. And, and she thinking, made you look... You were just sort of yeah, she's inspecting like, it. it. Right. She's, like, warming me up to do it on my bum. Mm. And how, how, uh, how big was this thing, roughly? How long in... Well, that's that you crank the speculum open, don't you? So it okay. widens. Mm. Right. And was she, how long is it? It's quite it's sort just of... It's like a is gap. It six... Okay. You no, just, like how long ah, in her was it? Yeah, how like, far? It's a circle. Uh-huh. That's just cranked or open. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Just so see it's not in. that deep. You can see a depth, yeah. Because yeah. oh. it's like... It just opens everything up. Why does... Wow. Someone, this girl is wild. Yeah. 
me honestly yeah okay. yeah and so she wants she was basically um pitching that you did this so then she did do it so she did the speculum on me and i had to tell her to stop quite quickly and she goes oh don't worry i'm gonna if it's hurting i'm gonna rim your bum don't worry probably should have done that before <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah kiss so, it better first a bit like making a cocktail <laughs> So she's rimming and the pain is intense from the speculum. It feels like one of my elastic bands is going to snap. I'm like, take it off, take it off. Two minutes. So that didn't work very well either. Mm. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, We've that really point- gone off on it. <gasps> Uh, wait, was a, so <gasps> where were you when this, were you in, in in the country with her in her country or was she no no in this England. is in the UK where okay, okay so we don't seem to say whereabouts no because she's had a stalk and I don't want to get her in any trouble okay course. okay so yeah. she's those kind of people attract those stalks so this is happening and and how does that little relationship unfold how how do you get on with her from there we'll get back to the whole fucking other so, thing so there's all kinds of wild crazy sex stuff that we did all mm. right give me give me some ideas it's, it's at the point where she's uh, we're we're choosing an AI sex doll together and Jesus. Um, male or female t- female <laughs> just check she wants to have threesomes with an AI sex doll that was the thing right. how good are they these days I've, uh, I've seen we didn't end up having a threesome with an oh. AI sex doll Did well, you it's not a threesome well, we it is, just, it, we it is a twosome we and a sex doll <laughs> yeah. again it's not a real person so it's not a threesome is it it's just a well what kind of pricing are we looking at what kind of oh yeah uh, these what? are like thousands of pounds and are you specking wow. it up sort of thing like you know can you get the M1 chip in it or like what <laughs> yeah, are you yeah. yeah there's all kinds of different okay. things and they reply they talk to you they yeah yeah right hi they, Sean right <laughs> I love you and then it just sort of sits there apart from that fuck me and they've got, do you pick the hair colour because we've everything, seen the documentary everything. we've seen we think we've watched this on True News before like the kind of these people make them and they you know use breast size and all these kind of yeah. things you pick that. she'd picked one out with big boobs and everything right yeah Wait, so, wait, wait so, so you're I'm assuming you're not that into this you're just sort of going along with it for the fun or so, so the normal this? sex was amazing hmm. but then she wanted to demolish my bum at a higher level every week she was like it was going up and we had a conversation at the end where she said that's that's what she was doing she was trying to break me in because these things that she fantasizes about doing even though it's a career she's made a career out of it because she naturally just thinks about that stuff all day long it's like honey to her it's, it's, it's a bit like you in football Lawrence it's identical <laughs> right yeah you think about football turn it into a job <sighs> yeah exactly go. yeah I was just so she- obsessed with just making football bigger <laughs> Make football great again. Yeah. Okay. Let's see so football. I'm on the phone to Hammy giving him my weekly reports as to what's happened, what's gone down. The, right. the, 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 the fake sperm, the, all these different contraptions Why and the, toys. So she was in, uh, sort of obsessed in fake sperm as well, because obviously so there's a bit of a. She was. Uh, okay, so that's coming out of a toy, I'm assuming. Yeah. She wanted to jizz yeah. in people's bums with fake sperm. Right. right. Which is understandable. Okay. I think a lot of women are probably at some point gone, what's that like? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't even know there was such a thing as fake sperm. You must be curious, though. It's just icing sugar, probably. You must be curious at some <laughs> point. Yeah, real sperm, I bet. Yeah, just for all the people out there, coming as a man is amazing. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I admire a woman who is um, up for doing random things like this, but at the same time, she's taken it a bit too far. Man, I told I called Hammy the last two times I left mm. her house. Mm. I told him about the, the blood in my shit, mm. and he's like, "You gotta f- stop. You can't. You can't keep going like this. You're gonna <laughs> have fucking seriously internal, serious internal wow. damage." Yeah, especially during coronavirus, it's very difficult to go to. You know, yeah. Do you, and she was acting a bit crazy, and she kept looking at me with this stir, and she said, "If you know, if we stop seeing each other." I'll never ever harm you and in my head I knew that means this woman is going to fucking try and destroy me if we ever stop seeing each other well, there's a vindictive than the Sean, Sean welcome to being a celebrity <sighs> because when people don't want to fucking let you go and you try and let go and they don't want to let you go yeah. they're thinking I'll do anything it takes to take you down now Yeah, believe me man. so I'm thinking I can recycle that by leaking her the photo because We'd been watching and laughing at together the hermaphrodite videos. Mm -hmm. So she knew all about the hermaphrodite and knew the hermaphrodite was trying to get me with anything possible. So by putting the picture of Callie on adult work and this woman, the arse rapist, being on adult work, (laughs) putting a picture of Callie on my balcony, we knew what would happen next. Right. Which which, which, which did happen next. Had you already broke up with her by this point? Um, yeah how was that breakup how did that conversation go 
you're getting too attached and I tried to just be as gentle as possible ironic mm. Mm. Uh, mm. there's blood on my shit but I'm going to be as gentle as possible yeah, exactly yeah I mean you can't bring up all the sex stuff sometimes it's probably bad to bring up sex stuff during a breakup you kind of want to make it about the You're it's hurting. me not it's you hurting. yeah you don't want to go down that route really because actually if anything that's helping her get off on it People, isn't it this is yeah. the thing though this, this mental blackmail that was put on you there's not enough understood about this or ac- ac- acknowledged in uh, modern day society because obviously when when men hurt women um, often it is physical and it leaves physical marks and you're much more able to go to the police about that but when you're being blackmailed or you're being threatened Mm. mentally no one can deal with that really especially with women it's often sort of Oh, you'll, 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 if you go to the police with that, they, they don't do anything. They're not going to do anything. It's hard to quantify, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You've got to take matters into your own hands. Unfortunately, I don't know if you played it right. But What, what led to... What <clears throat> led to why, why do this specific plan that you came up with? Because obviously looking back now, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's a it's a bad plan. Yeah. Okay. I am completely desensitized and Callie is completely desensitized. And we thought if we just go balls to the wall and do the sickest joke possible, and the only way we're going to fool the troll is if we send the content that is really sick, that th- th- she would think they can't possibly be leaking this to me because this is just so sick. Right. Then once we show the making of the prank, everyone will be on our side Mm -hmm. and the night we showed the prank we were slapping each other on the back saying what good actors we were we thought like we'd really done a solid okay so and people from all over the world who saw it were contacting me saying thank god you took that troll down and her channel got slaughtered right and for days we thought we we thought we pulled it off okay so so just to describe the video that you actually leaked there was a couple that i see one is where callie looks like she's about to perform a sexual act on you yes. although you don't actually say any nudity or anything like that yes. no. um, your, your breathing in that made me feel slightly uncomfortable you have excellent uh, acting though again <laughs> it looked like you were anyway um, <laughs> luckily there wasn't an erection otherwise I could oh, never God. have looked them in the eye again mm. and then and then in the Method. other video we see in your sort of um, drinking and it, it looks like you're using drugs um, and you're, snorting flour mm. and you're talking to her about oh, uh, money and stuff like that and give us the cash and it, you know to me who knows you uh, I was like this doesn't I stack up you're, this isn't who he is like you know yeah. but obviously if you're desperate for you to be this bad guy you're going to take it hook line and take it so you thought you'd won yeah. You then had a whole making of the prank video that you then released to show that it was all a joke. Yeah. Why do you what went, went wrong after that? Did something go wrong? It felt it feels like it didn't end up the way you planned it. Okay. So and you ended up taking <clears throat> that video down that showed the prank being made. Yeah, yeah, I had to take everything down. So what happened was I armed the trolls and the trolls started to make all these videos using like little clips of it and stuff and getting people outraged. And they contacted the company I was doing the live streams for. And then the, the, the company that I was doing the live streams for, then they took matters into the, their own hand and said, you, you know, you do these um, apology videos and get grilled by the co-host and then don't ever speak about this. What did you apologize for exactly though? Because to me, although, what, what are you apologizing for? Okay, so the main thing that caused the problem was the video of her on her knees in the right. in the mi- and I've learned what the outfit was recently because someone sent me a link to it on Amazon. It's a milkmaid outfit <laughs> with cat ears. Okay. Right. And because she used the word daddy in it, and because me and my co-host were at the forefront of activism exposing pedophiles and child sex abuse and trafficking, to some people it was distasteful that I did that in a prank. And did you, had you, um, had you sort of, uh, had, had you just not mentally made that connection? Because I'm desensitized. I come from a place, you know, that was prison gang yeah. rapes and beheading stories and seeing blood squirt out people's heads and all that kind well, of thing. you didn't think it through in that regard? I was thinking I was going to get credited with destroying this troll. Hmm. Now, for people who've criticized, um, some people have said, right, that... Callie is autistic and I basically I've just got someone soft in the head on her knees and took advantage of her Mm. now Callie is high functioning aspergic she is like 
has a photographic memory and she ha is genius level on things. She sent me some of her writing. She can't spell for shit, but she writes prose like an artist. And I, the first time she showed me some of her writing. And I you're, said, you're an author yourself, so you're, you're qualified to judge this. Yeah, first time she showed me some of her writing. I said, who wrote that? Mm. I said, who wrote that? She goes, don't fucking insult me. I wrote that. It was that beautiful, her prose. Okay. So... If she was, let's just say, if she was um, soft in the head and I took advantage of her and, and did all this, let's just assume that, that the criticisms were correct. The people who would call me out the most on that would be her family members. So let me read a text sent to me by her foster mother, who was aware of the prank and everything and aware of the backlash. And she said, um, about the backlash, it sounds harsh and hectic, brother. Surely everyone can have a sense of humor. If a trafficked woman can make a joke about being trafficked, the viewers should find some compassion instead of judgment. But it was distasteful to some people and I do regret it and I wish I hadn't done it. It was like, it was like my hang suicide forest moment on my right. channel. It, yeah, it was... Um I'm your mate and I want to be really truthful with you. I think you'd built up a, a, a large level of uh, credibility in your books, in your speaking, helping children, helping with everything you try to take down. And you fucked up. Because yeah. you gave them that ability to try and take you down and, and take away from the good stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? And take yeah. things out of context but as well. You know. Um, yeah, you, you've made some... Cr I can't judge because I've made crazy life decisions when I've got popular and done stupid things that I regret and stuff and you know you you haven't actually hurt anyone though you know what I mean you haven't actually tried to hurt anyone you haven't hurt anyone you've just made a stupid mistake and you, you didn't think it through clearly the mm. motivation was pure it was to take someone down who was trying to have Callie's kid taken away from, yeah. away from it was asking people to snitch and call social services the, 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 the biggest mistake you can ever make with a troll is actually acknowledging that they exist I know, in the first place I know and that's the desperation the, 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 the campaigns against me this is how sneaky they are so the, these channels that are putting videos up on one of the channels they interviewed someone and these people are purporting to be my former subscribers and Patreon donors. And this woman who was recently interviewed, who got thousands of views, she said, I used to, the tragic thing is I used to love Sean Atwood. I've supported him for years. In fact, I was his Patreon donor three years ago. And she goes on and on, just says all of these lies for about an hour and gets thousands of views on it. My Patreon's only been up for just over a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, they t they, But they are sucking in some of my subscribers to believe these things and so to try and help those subscribers not believe those things i've addressed some of the trolls concerns so the trolls said that the balcony was on the first uh, i was on the first floor wasn't the second floor she couldn't possibly have wanted to commit suicide so we did a video of me dropping a melon off the second floor and then the troll said, I'd obviously gone in my neighbor's apartment and dropped the melon right, from okay. there. So, but so the, the, yeah. then, then they said, the GoFundMe, I'd, put all, I'd spent all that money on myself. They, they complained to GoFundMe and said I, I was committing fraud. So yeah. Go, GoFundMe launched this investigation. And these weren't the donors. People were still donating money after the prank. These are busybodies, trolls, and troublemakers. But the more you respond to them, I know. The, mo the worse it gets because the, the more that they feel like there is a fight, yes. the more the fight intensifies from their yes, side. Yes, yes, so yes. So by you going, I'm going to drop a watermelon off here to prove that you guys are wrong, the, the more that antagonizes them. And I've, the completely, more that I've completely stopped now because I did that to show the people who were my followers don't be getting tricked by these people the GoFundMe thing was the last I got all the bank statements proved it all went to Callie's rent sent all that to my co-host uh, on the live streams that was all authorized um, GoFundMe cleared it all and um, that's the last I've ever done to respond to the trolls I'm not going to be responding to the trolls ever again uh, yeah you can't you, you, not only can you not respond yeah you can't even listen yeah because yeah, yeah. there's difference between true criticism of a real fan who really likes you and says look I think you made a mistake with this or whatever yeah but, but this is just to try and mentally fuck you and the more that you actually read I, I remember like a while back I, I was reading a comment that was just like like a troll comment just to hurt your feelings and I thought ah I'm not doing this anymore, me. Like, I'm mm -hmm. out of this. I'm finished. Yeah. Over. Yeah. And if that means I'm going to miss some of the nice ones as well, but I focus mm -hmm. on making the videos, mm -hmm. and that actually gives 
uh, the fans what they really want yes then then I'm doing what I need to do and then mentally at least I'm not getting fucked <sighs> off about it or bothered about it so, so how I, I was, I was, I had a good attitude towards the trolls for a year, but I just snapped over this situation. Yeah. And what you're saying is 100 percent true. Channel that energy into content creation for your genuine fans, and that's going to rule the day. So, so how does that play into the darker side of things, where there are actual you, you're saying there are actual people who are trying to silence you? Yeah. Do you think are these two separate issues, or are these two things somehow interlinked in your mind? I believe that it is all interlinked and that there are various trolling missions going on right now with people with different motivations um, people I've pissed off for one reason or another mm. people in power who just want my reputation destroyed and just you know just teenagers just getting off on it adding to, adding to the action so yeah so there's the regular trolls which we all have mm. but you think that there's a little bit of a higher level of thing going on because of the 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 content that you're making is generally about high level government conspiracies in regards to child sex and stuff like that so Sonia my co-host said she has researched it and she believes that there is proper high level black ops agent provocateur stuff going on to destroy the information that we were getting out so which cases in particular that you've covered do you think would have provoked that sort of stuff well look at the names that we've concentrated on Prince Andrew and okay. Wildman kept joking, you're going to go for a jog one day in the forest and Prince Andrew's guys are, are going to come and get you. Mm -hmm. um, so can, we, can we cover a little bit of this situation right now? Yeah. So, so since we last spoke to you, um, really very little has happened to this guy. They've gone very, very quiet. They've protected him. They've took him back into the royal circle and that's the end of that, really. It's, it's, you know, he, what he admitted to, realistically, the, that car crash interview that he did anyone else it was quite good actually gets, was gets en well it was entertaining yeah uh, but when you look at someone who basically doesn't have the answers and, and God knows how they let that happen I mean it just shows how carefree the royal family can be sometimes with how untouchable they actually are and people really underestimate what the royal family actually are in this, in this country but you obviously you know um, what is the situation with that case right now where are we okay so Ghislaine Maxwell who Prince Andrew knew from when she was in university, she was raided and she is pending trial right now in America. Mm -hmm. So the memes are like, when's she gonna get suicided or COVIDed? Because if she starts naming people, it would be at the level of Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton. And when I'm asked about that, my response is that she w it will never go to trial because when names are come out in court certain government agencies have to take action upon them those names will have to be protected so in the interest of national security she'll be told sign a plea bargain go to prison do so many years get on with your life and by national security what we mean is is if the if the rest of the american people found out the true details of what bill clinton was up to as president and post that they'd be hell on so we have to make sure that that doesn't come out. Exactly. And a lot of people are waking up now to the cocaine trafficking that the Bush and Clinton crime families did to finance that war in Nicaragua. But the sex stuff, trafficking of kids and exploiting teenagers and for people to comprehend that if you're that powerful that you're a president or a prince you engage in that activity for some people that's too much of a contradiction for them to accept it in their heads so w w where else is is your research taking you at the moment i mean epstein obviously um that 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 case is now still going really isn't it so the epstein case we're still reporting on that regularly i've partnered up with ron swanson shout out to him he's got a youtube channel and he does research on the dark web mm. And that's really horrific stuff, such as red rooms. What's a red room? So a red room is whereby they're live streaming the torture of a kid and the possible murder of a kid, and you get to pay for the various levels of torture, and you can even pay to have the kid killed. And what? Uh, who, who was doing this and who was watching this? So wealthy predator pedophile people all over the world watch these things mm. the kids are sourced in countries like the philippines 
and there are cases where you know these people have been busted and it's 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 gone to the court system i was watching a documentary the other day you might have seen it on netflix called i think it's called tell me who i am oh Uh, yeah about the the twins brothers so um and it's about the it's like aristocratic society basically where uh, one brother at 18 19 years old gets into an accident car accident can't remember anything other than his own brother his own his own twin brother basically recreates their life and tells them a completely different life story and as they get older they the mother dies they climb into the attic or whatever and they find these pictures of him naked as boys and then his brother has to basically admit like we were basically used by the, the mother and father and sent out to other rich families while we were young boys and handed around the men and you know in this sort of level of wealth it, it was sort of not an unusual thing and I guess it's just sort of mind-blowing um, that how quiet this is but how possibly widespread it could be and I've interviewed some experts on it and I've said if people have got all this money and power why on earth do they want to do this stuff with kids that you know could get them in serious trouble but but, but maybe paedophilia is a lot more common than what we actually realize (laughs) but at that level because money affords you opportunity to have whatever you want they're able to get away with it in, in by paying for it etc do you know what I mean let's be honest Michael Jackson is the fucking king of pop no he's the king of paedophiles actually um, this man was research. paying parents and, 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 and paying off children 20 million the first kid got by the way for fucking decades and yet because we all like his music and because a lot of people like his music they refuse to fucking acknowledge the dozens of children that came forward like uh, how come this is just a little mini rant of mine but how come we all believe the women who came out about R. Kelly and and rightly so but all of the children Michael Jack oh they just want the money you know it's like actually I think you find children are quite believable they're very believable you know and it's that mental contradiction that people can't cope with Um, in my research there was someone present at a dinner that George H.W. Bush was hosting Mm. and someone asked Bush you know how can you be waging this war on drugs while at the same time running all these drugs in through the CIA to finance this war in Nicaragua. And he said that it's so far removed from what the public w- would possibly believe, that's how I get away with it. And that is the case in many of these sort of high-level criminals, isn't it? Whatever they're into, whatever they're doing, if they're in the face and they're smiling. There's a thing called elite deviance, yeah. and that states that if you have got all this power and money, A, you've got the resources to get away with it if you get caught, mm-hmm. and B to get your thrills and kicks you've got to do stuff that's sicker and sicker and sicker and that's right. what leads to paedophilia and and it, i'm not suggesting that trump and biden are paedophiles but if you look into them there's so many things that are questionable in regards to the way they've trapped women and i mean if you there's compilations of joe biden inappropriately touching children compilations The president, the man who was president, has got that many cases against him that he's paid that many people off, Trump, and these are the two guys running, and they're both questionable backgrounds sexually in regards to people. Like, this is the presidential election, and they're both guys, not just one. And they're in this seven, it blows my mind how this is the world I'm living in. Like, it's fucking insane. It's all public persona versus satanic persona. The media does a good job with the spin. But it's the internet, thanks to the rise of the internet, that's enabling us to expose a lot of this stuff. Mind you, though, like, we we uncovered, like, um, there was a tweet that went sort of, like, we were doing um, a bit of research the other day about COVID or something, and we, we seen, like, there was a tweet that was tweeted out, like, thousands of times by so many different <laughs> accounts about how we need to enforce people to have the vaccine and stuff like make sure that, like, and we're looking like where are all this where's this come from and it's like so what what it seems like is although the internet has been our freedom of information to get it they, they're getting their fingernails on it now and they're starting to find ways to use it in their direction now aren't they yeah I mean look at what they're doing to Julian Assange if anyone 
need some help it's him mm -hmm. he sacrificed his life for the truth he's the only person in journalism who everything he's ever published has been shown to be 100 percent true what are they doing to julian assange now just because it's kind of hard to find out in um well he's in a prison around here and he's getting they're trying to extradite him to america where they were calling for the death penalty on him at one point for treason and so is, is, how does treason work because um if what you say is found to be true obviously in a way you've sort of just done the right thing in that sense that's why it's kind of it's it, for, again it, for a lot of people it's a contradiction he's done he's revealed something that ultimately seemed to help the public which is what the government is supposed to do so there's quite a there's a very there's difficult mental gymnastics you have to do to find him to be the bad guy the prosecutors have framed it that he was in a conspiracy with chelsea manning to expose things that endangered people who were in operations around the world right. they've never ever come forward and shown anyone who was endangered by the information that julian assange put out but that's the spin that they put on it how do you how do you feel holding um so much of this kind of information and how do you um you know for example when we see david ike you've interviewed david ike right. yeah. a few times it, it, Obviously, I don't agree with everything he says, but you can clearly tell he's done a lot of research. And sometimes he just looks like the weight of the world's on his shoulders because he is just sort of. And and it does feel like you're you're kind of following in those footsteps a little mm -hmm. bit. And I never ex sense. when we first interviewed you, it was about your story. And yes, you were doing research, but the more you go on, the more you're sort of heading in that direction too. And when you look at how it served David Ike much of which has been hatred and backlash and ridicule it's a it's not a really rewarding path to walk are you sure you want to do this mate i think my channel started out as interviewing people who've been in prison and then it branched out into various true crime stories but then it started to really focus on victims of abuse and it's great to have people on have been victims of abuse to get the stories out and to see all the feedback and the love they get and how that really helps them and shapes what they're doing in their lives it's really powerful but when i'm talking to these people and absorbing the darkness even though i am desensitized on the surface i do imagine that it's accruing inside me and perhaps has contributed to me making the mistake with the prank because as you destabilize emotionally your rational thought processes reduce and then you're more prone to making mistakes and i think i destabilized emotionally but specifically in regards to the conspiracy level that you're going to and the epstein stuff and you've covered that more than anyone on the internet as we said you're you know like like wild man was making those jokes but you're putting yourself at risk you're you're giving yourself a lot to live with you don't know who the fuck is around the corner who's watching you is that are you just sort of ignoring that and thinking, not thinking about it or does it make you feel anywhere? Something happened to me when I was a teenager and I just think that I suppressed it and for people who've been through things, I relate to them and I feel that the mission to get those stories out of there is more important than the risks to my personal safety. Fair enough, mate. So as for Wild Man, um, it's it's very recently he's passed away what is the situation with his um burial and stuff or his cremation so the information i got was that the oxygen mask had come off him mm -hmm. and there was an investigation and now they've told me that it was multiple organ failure but because of corona and the backlog in funerals and autopsies and things like that uh, that perhaps that the funeral will be the, at the latter half of December and researching about funerals during this epidemic I think only 30 people can attend funerals mm -hmm, mm -hmm. god it's it's ridiculous I'm sorry uh, that, that, that you're going to go through that like not having able to have everyone there when we've got Anthony Joshua fighting this month with a thousand people allowed to attend and yet people you, you got 30 people max at a funeral it's fucking mental this thing and mm. this is the inconsistencies that's really fucking me off with this shit no see you've got people saying goodbye to their loved ones via FaceTime and then you've got Anthony Joshua out of box with a thousand people there no disrespect because I love AJ but it's just like where's the consistency here this is insane yeah in a funeral do you actually see the person well, you can. you can go to see them at the Chapel of Rest beforehand, in my experience. Um, 
if it's a burial especially uh, that's what happened in my experiences previously and um, if you get the chance I'd recommend it to have that moment with them I do want to do that yeah I think that'll yeah, be lovely think, it'll be but, hard mm. but and you know but they're, they're just asleep mate yeah and it's, yeah. you're seeing your friend asleep Some, sometimes the place you least want to look is the place you look you know mm-hmm. and yeah. I think that's probably really important in that moment yeah mm. have that if you can mm. I, I hope that you get that because um, you know it's never goodbye because you know what the great thing about dying is we all do it and it's not an exclusive club and although it feels like goodbye right now it isn't goodbye because wherever the, I don't know about religion and all of that shit but I do know wherever wild man goes you're going the same place mate because you did all the same shit <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in Valhalla <laughs> yeah genuinely wherever he's that's it isn't it, like, and, his, it and his family and Hammy really appreciated that he, so much love came out for him that it was trending on Twitter for six hours and I've got to credit mm. you guys with doing your tweets to get mm. that in motion mm. every minute every few minutes it was R.I.P. Wildman for six hours I had no idea amazing that the amount of love and support and the kindness of people from all over the world so yeah thanks very much for doing that and ten, his fa- ten, thank ten. you from his family as well well this podcast was dedicated to Peter Mahoney aka the wild man yes and there's um, over 100 videos on his playlist on my channel. Yeah, um, well worth a look. Yeah. yeah, we'll put the link for that in the description and the donation link um, for his daughter in there as well. To make sure that um, any money you guys want to donate will go to his daughter. Um, check out Sean Atwood's YouTube channel. I'm sure it's going to be eventful after everything you told us today. Almost at 600k subs and you started it. You deserve it, mate. <laughs> You've worked your arse off. And Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm proud of you. Now, um, focus on what you do best which is getting that content out mate definitely yeah, yeah some lessons learned this year for many people mm. yeah I'm sure yeah. I think this virus has been like a stress test on society whereby it's a test on relationships business relationships people's health mm. and it's affecting people all over the world and it's watching videos like yours mm. you know you, you work out video and stuff I think it's just so important right now during this time that we keep creating that content because people mm. are stuck at home and things that we just think are run of the mill and normal you get an email saying from someone I was feeling suicidal I watched you guys clowning about something mm. and it, it made me think twice about what I was going to do to myself yeah I think we've always known podcasts give people uh, they're like the other member at the table who isn't isn't joining in but is with us and the amount of uh, messages we get about you know uh, they did the Spotify thing recently where it comes out oh how many numbers people listen to and just just nice little messages saying you helped me get through the year and uh, it w- it's been a fucking hard year for everyone I think we can all agree on that so hopefully uh, we'll get you back on next year and it'll be a bit better mm. thank you very much and a huge thank you to all the viewers and subscribers for all the love and support really appreciate it through what's happened alright don't forget to hit that like button stay subscribed the True Jordy YouTube channel R.I.P. Wild Man thank you well done, mate. Oh, well done. Awesome. I really Great. needed that, honestly. Great. I just needed that with, with fucking, with people I really trust.